Announcements. The member from Rice, Representative Lippert. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, let the retirements begin. Here we go. So I've spent my professional life in sacred spaces, and it's been an honor to be working in this sacred space with all of you on behalf of the people of Minnesota. I didn't expect to spend a few years of my life here. I didn't grow up in a house that, where we talk politics. I didn't have political ambitions. I've realized that the only reason I'm here is because I'm a Christian. As I studied the Bible more and more, my political views took shape. The biblical themes of caring for creation, justice for the poor, and welcoming the stranger shaped me and led me here. I ran for office because I care about my home. I grew up in a town of 700 people. I've intentionally ministered in small towns like the one I grew up in. Many rural communities and rural people have lost a lot. Communities founded by European immigrants have seen tremendous change in the last 40 years. My family lost its farm, its family farm, like so many others. People have lost jobs. Opportunities are limited. I certainly had plenty of people telling me to leave my hometown because there was nothing for me there. Tribal nations have lost the land that was given to my ancestors. German immigrants who went to Ukraine to farm and then left, fled because of war, and settled like so many in South Dakota and North Dakota. New immigrants and refugees from East Africa and Latin America who are revitalizing many small communities have often lost everything too, trying to save their families and start a new life. Poverty is a reality in so many communities. You see it as you drive through. And many rural people, black, brown, and white, feel like others look down on them. There are a couple things I think our rural communities need. First, I think our rural communities need everyone in this room. I don't think people in small communities are going to be able to address the challenges in front of us alone. More extreme weather due to climate change, an aging population, and the need for caregivers, workforce shortages, and more. Now, I don't think big business is going to come to our rescue, because there's always going to be more people and more profit somewhere else. We're going to need the state to be a strong partner, people acting in good faith through government for the common good, because government can include people when others will leave them behind. Second, we need our neighbors in urban areas to have their needs met as well. It's the human thing to do. But also, there are so many needs we share in common. Our neighbors in urban areas need housing. We need housing in rural areas. Property tax poor areas in urban areas need good schools. Property tax poor, poor communities in rural areas need good schools. We need access to health care and mental health care across the state. We will be stronger and have the power to make change when we build coalitions across race and geography. And I know that's what some are afraid of, too. We know we're in a perilous moment in our nation's history. Those who study civil war tell us we're checking off the boxes right now. But we can still create a future that includes those so often left behind. We can resist turning neighbors into enemies. We can marginalize those who turn us against one another, encouraging us to ignore our shared humanity. We can choose to be leaders who build bridges and dismantle fear rather than manipulate it. There have been many hopeful moments for me in this chamber, frustrating ones too. So many of you on both sides of the aisle are so good at building relationship across difference, much better at it than me. 
And oftentimes those relationships are at the surface level, it's just joking around. But then there are moments when things get real and those relationships matter. And things happen because of them. There have also been moments where I've seen this chamber truly listen. Just a few days ago, as Representative Richardson was powerfully remembering our black neighbors in Buffalo who were shot, who were murdered by a white supremacist. I was looking around the chamber. It wasn't just her DFL friends who were listening to her. Those moments give me hope, and Minnesota deserves more of them. Those of you who build relationship across difference and do that well, Minnesota needs you now. My work on behalf of my home will continue in a different form, and I know all of us will be continuing to work on the things that we're passionate about. There's so many people here I deeply admire and have learned so much from, and I'm grateful to you for that. I'm grateful to my constituents for entrusting me with this great responsibility. I pray I've served them well, and I'm grateful to my family, too, for supporting me through it all. It's been an honor to serve with you. Thank you. The member from Washington, Representative Christensen. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I've been enriched beyond measure. Thank you to everyone who works here in this place, in this beautiful building to make a better Minnesota. Thank you for the support of my new and old friends and neighbors in the community that raised me. And most importantly, Thank you to my husband and my family who have patiently and ardently been my biggest supporters. My time in the legislature has truly been amazing. I am blessed, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Member from Washington, Representative Detmer. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, I'm not, I was going to be short, but not that short. But uh, <laughs> I am kind of short, though. But uh, no, thank you all. It's been an honor uh, uh, serving here with you all. And, uh, but I do have a couple stories I'd like to just tell you a little bit. First of all, uh, the support I've had over the years with my wife, we're going on 50 years. She knows me well. And uh, I've been endorsed. I've been endorsed my wife to retire. And uh, you take that endorsement very seriously. But uh, let's go back a few years. We have twin sons that uh, when they were in junior high, I, you know, and, and I served in the military for 25 years, and I always talked to them about the military. And when I was teaching courses at Fort Devens and Fort Massachusetts, in, Fort, in Massachusetts and also Fort Devens in, in Arizona, and I would always take the family with me when I'm teaching these courses. And uh, when I was commissioned as a warrant officer, I gave each, each, each of the boys a big silver dollar. And I told them what, what that meant in terms of a first salute. And so I forgot about it. And, Years goes by, and all of a sudden, my wife and I are standing up in Mikey Stadium at, at West Point. The boys uh, have just made it through West Point. They're four years, and uh, they're down on the field in Mikey Stadium. The hats go up. You've probably seen it on television. My wife and I are up in the, up in the stands. I'm in uniform, and uh, we go running down there, and both, both sons are sitting there just at, at attention. And uh, I go walking up to them, and I give them a salute. Do you know what they did? 
They pulled out those same silver dollars and gave them back to me that I gave them when they were in junior high. And uh, one more story. I can't forget about her daughter, daughter Crystal. Uh, I'm deployed after 9-11, Iraqi freedom. And uh, my wife, kept, I was able to call back, you know, once a week. And she was always wondering when I could come home because our daughter's going to graduate. I missed her junior year and now I missed her senior year and she, I was supposed to have her in class. And I said, I don't know if I can get back in time for the graduation. And uh, my, my mission was pretty much done there. And for somehow my wife got a hold of the com commanding general of intelligence command. I don't know how she did it, but she, she, she texted this two-star general and asked if I could have a two-week leave to come home for graduation. With his general, he must have been sitting at his uh, terminal like most generals do, right? And uh, he texts her right back. He says, well, I can't promise anything. I do know his brigade commander. P.S. I have four daughters. Well, about a week goes by. They always come by my section that I was in charge of. They give me a list of those uh, members of our unit had, that had to fly back to the States. Guess what? My name's on it. So I get on a flight, get back to the U.S., get to, back to Fort Gordon, Georgia. My wife kept this all from our daughter. She didn't know I was going to be back in, in the country. She gets, my wife gets a uh, ticket for me to fly up to Minneapolis, and our daughter was performing in a concert graduation concert, and she, she was uh, to sing a solo. They stuck me into the school. I'm standing behind stage in a fresh uniform with a thing of flowers, roses, and I'm listening to her solo. Her solo was someone to watch over me. And at the end of her solo, the MC says, well, Crystal, that was a beautiful solo. I, we just know your, your dad would like to have been here for that. But wait, he is here. That was my key to come out on stage. And the place just went up crazy in the auditorium. And I can still remember our daughter's face when she turned around and saw me. What's the moral of the story? She, come, she just ran across the stage and gave me a hug. What's the moral of the story? Never underestimate the power of a, of a mom, uh, especially over a general. But those are two stories that will always be part of my life. And uh, 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. That's something that's always been part of me through my years of coaching, military, and here at the legislature. I've developed some great friends, not only within our caucus, but across the aisle. I think uh, one thing I've learned over the years, you don't burn your bridges. You keep building bridges. Even though you disagree with people within your own caucus, you discuss those in caucus, not on the House floor. Even though you disagree with whatever is going on across the aisle, you try to search them out and talk to them. And I think uh, I've learned those things over the years here in the, in the legislature. Our support staff is outstanding. The people sitting up front, we know what they do. The people that support us in our own caucuses and our LAs and our researchers, those people are just outstanding. In fact, uh, my LA, Rebecca Mead, is up, standing right up there. Would you everybody give her a hand? <laughs> our researcher, John Holtquist, and our media writer, Jason Winish. Th these people make us look good, legislators, don't they? Uh, and I'm not a writer, and, but these people, they sit down and they chat with you, they talk with you, and you try to get your message across to your constituents, and that's so important. Our leadership over the years has been outstanding. Kurt and Ann have done an outstanding job. 
these few years, and the leaders before them have done outstanding jobs. Same across the aisle. And my relationship with different agencies, like Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs and Military Affairs, I guess you could say I've been one of their allies. And I hope, I hope that uh, this legislature will continue putting our legislation forward for our men and women that serve in our military and keep that as a forefront what this institution is all about too. Why was this building built in honor of those that served in the Civil War? We need to keep that up front for us and I know that we have several people that have served. Thank you for your service. And again, to maybe just finish up here, 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Thank you. The member from Ramsey, Representative Wozniak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm not used to going this early with a last name that starts with W. I'm usually close to the end. So um, I want to start my remarks, my remarks today by sharing a quote that um, I heard several years ago and I just think is really, uh, just so, just really encapsulates the reason that I ran for office. I think the reason why a lot of us are here. Um, and it's a quote by Lily Tomlin. And the quote is, I said, somebody should do something about that. Then I realized I am somebody. Um, I think this, this quote has really um, sort of been in the back of my mind as I've done this work, um, as I've done other work in public service. Um, but I, I had two experiences early in my, earlier in my life that really shaped uh, my reasons for running for office um, that serve as a reminder of why I do this work. Um, no matter how tough it is, no matter how long floor debates go, no matter how late we're here, um, these sorts of experiences and stories um, are uh, an inspiration for me, and I would imagine we all have similar stories that are inspirations for why we do this work. Um, during college, I volunteered as a sexual assault and domestic violence advocate with an on-campus organization at the University of Minnesota. Uh, my experience working with victim survivors revealed to me that our systems were broken and needed significant change. Um, I, a couple of specific examples of, of sort of just the, the shock that I had about this and, and the desire for these changes. Um, I worked with a client who was being harassed by her ex-boyfriend, um, and it was, it was a really difficult process for, for me and my, my, um, the other advocates to get, um, find relief for her, and she finally ended up giving up um, when her ex actually took her dog, um, her beloved dog, um, and, and it was just, it was, a, it was a horrible thing as an advocate to have to, to have to essentially say, we can't do anything, we can't do anything more. Um, and then uh, a couple other experiences in this field. Um, I, I used to write harassment training orders and orders for protection. Um, I just always remember this. I presented a harassment training order to a judge who said that he thought receiving hundreds of unwanted calls and texts per day was just love. And I agonized over a case um, where a sexual assault victim was re-victimized over and over again. Um, and the end result was that we did not find any sort of justice um, for her. And again, coming back to the theme, I thought somebody should do something about that. The other experience that inspired me um, happened after college. Um, I worked as a reading tutor with AmeriCorps in a um, high poverty elementary school in St. Paul. Um, several students that I worked with were years behind their peers in reading ability. I was working with some, some fourth graders who were reading at a kindergarten level. Um, but they were also some of the sweetest kids that I've ever met. Um, and they're all like in their 20s now and it makes me feel really old. <laughs> um, I really got to know these kids when I worked one-on-one -on -one with them um, and learned things that I as a you know, middle class kid from the suburbs had never really been exposed to or experienced myself. Um, I worked with these kids uh, who came to school in the middle of winter with holes in their pants, um, kids whose parents were in and out of jail, kids who didn't sleep well because gunshots kept them awake at night. And there was one social worker at the school, and she was overwhelmed. Um, and it was, it was clear to me at that time, you know, in my role as a reading tutor, there wasn't a lot that I could do. Um, but what I did know was that that school and those kids and their families and their communities um, needed more support and resources than what they were getting. Somebody should do something about that. 
So I took these experiences uh, with me to graduate school um, and then started working in a different field uh, when the opportunity to run for office arose. Uh, it wasn't like some grand, like, I'm going to step in and be a hero here. It was literally, we need someone, and I said, I could do that. Um, and now here we are several years later, and I'm giving this retirement speech on the House floor. Uh, when I started here in 2019, I had little idea of what I was getting into. Um, I spent the first few months learning and building relationships and really in, in those early days of 2019 really considered this my dream job, nerding out on policy and helping people. What could be better than that? Despite the partisanship and posturing, we've accomplished a lot over the last few years together. Um, I'm just going to talk about a few of the things. This is not all that we've accomplished, but a few of the things that I think um, we've really come together as a body to do. Um, some of the earliest things that we did, um, we passed legislation to help farmers deal with mental health issues. Um, we heard from farmers across the state, we heard from our colleagues, we heard from uh, folks that represent farmer organizations about the need for this, this help, um, given what was happening with our farmers, and we, we did that. Um, we've also addressed, you know, the, the big, uh, all of the big letter things, the CWD and the EAB and the AIS, all those things in the environment area, we really came together to address those things, those urgent needs. Um, we did some really good work um, to uh, protect Minnesotans living in assisted living facilities and um, to, to raise the wages of direct care workers, the folks who are providing that care. Um, we, we did a lot of, uh, I know it was hard work to address the opioid epidemic. Um, with some really good bipartisan work that was done um, to do that. Uh, we also, uh, Representative Howard and others, worked really hard to, to make insulin more affordable for Minnesotans who need it. Um, we supported child care providers and families uh, who need access to child care. Um, we banned toxic chemicals like TCE and PFAS. We invested heavily in our schools and our students. As we know, the, those students that are coming through our school system right now are our future leaders, and it's, it's a really important thing that we're investing in those students. Uh, we expanded access to the medical cannabis program, um, which is really helpful for folks who need um, access to that program, as well as expanding access to broadband. Um, we helped employees, businesses, and local governments navigate and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so much more. This was a short list, and I, you know, there is so much more that we could add here. But I just, I, I want to say that despite the narrative that we often hear, despite what the media might say, despite what constituents might say, um, that we can't get anything done with a divided legislature, that we can't get anything done um, when we have disagreements, we actually can get a lot done. And we did get a lot done. And um, I hope that sort of, to uh, Representative Lippert's point, I hope that despite the partisanship and the polarization and how nasty that our politics has, has become, um, that we're really able to keep doing that good work, um, that we're really able to remember why we're here. Um, and I don't know what your why is, but my why is to um, do good for the people of Minnesota. It's been a hell of a few years. Um, we've been through a lot together, both good and bad. The one thing that's kept me going um, over the years when we've had you know, long floor debates and, and uh, late nights and all that sort of stuff um, is really the stories and experiences that my constituents um, have brought to me, have shared with me. Um, door knocking in 2018, I had a woman disclose that she was a victim of sexual assault. Um, I said that was an issue that was important to me and she, that was something that she shared with me um, when we were talking. Um, I had a mother who came to visit me who broke down crying in my office um, because her child has uh, severe disabilities and she was having a lot of trouble uh, providing care and also getting access to services for her child. I uh, had a cancer survivor um, who wondered if her disease was caused by water gremlins pollution, for those familiar with water gremlin and what happened there. Um, a constituent who shared the story of his son's struggle with addiction, uh, which has actually turned out positively, but it was, um, as those who have who have worked in, in this, on this issue of addiction, that's a very difficult thing to come through. You know, these stories that I shared are, were really the things that kept me centered um, and made sure that I, I kept my head and my heart in the game. I think it's really easy to kind of check out um, when we have to listen to a lot of difficult stories and a lot of difficult experiences. It can be overwhelming for us, and I think it's, but it's also a really good thing that, that really grounds us in this work. Um, as I wrap up, I just want to thank some of the folks who have helped me navigate this journey over the last few years. Um, I want to thank my legislative assistant, Spencer Kroos, who has patiently answered the same questions over and over and over um, and helped me connect with and take care of my constituents. Um, I want to thank Representative Peter Fisher, um, who has been a mentor of mine and listened to my frequent rants about this job and its frustrations. 
Um, I want to thank the women of the Neighborhood Concerned Citizens Group. Um, this was a group that was formed uh, after the water gremlin stuff broke a week after I got uh, sworn in. Um, and they have been a tremendous force in our community and here at the legislature. Um, they helped us become the first state uh, to ban TCE in the nation. Um, finally, actually not finally, uh, but I want to thank my parents um, who, have, who were my champions. Um, I was adding notes here as people were talking, but my parents who were my champions when I ran for office who also serve in that role of like, things are tough and I need to talk to someone, I need a hug, and they've, they've been great for that. Um, I want to thank my constituents for um, electing me to be here, for trusting me, for um, really uh, being there for me and, and also just you know, letting me know what's on their minds and, and, and giving me ideas for things to do. Um, finally, I want to thank uh, my DFL colleagues who have really put the team in teamwork. Um, they've spoken up for Minnesotans who often don't have a voice in this process and worked hard to advance our shared priorities here, priorities here in the House. Um, I'll end as I started with a quote. This one is from Nelson Mandela. What counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived. It is what difference we have made to the lives of others that will determine the significance of the life we lead. And that is sort of a guiding principle of my work that I've done, um, both in and outside of the legislature, and I hope can be um, a, a guiding um, piece of advice for the rest of us as, as you all continue the work. Thank you. The member from Ramsey, Representative Zhang. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Freiburg isn't here. I wanted to uh, quote Pericles for him, but uh, we'll have to skip that for today. Uh, but good morning, members. Um, I wish to leave some final remarks to give my thanks and appreciation for all of you who I have had the privilege to serve with for these past uh, four years. None of us ran, ran thinking that there would be a once in a hundred year pandemic. And with that, we all endured that together. I also wanted to honor my parents and the sacrifices they made uh, for me to, to allow me to be here. I want to acknowledge the Hmong exile community that helped raise me and help get me elected. And I want to thank my city of Maplewood that allowed me, uh, gave me everything that allowed me to succeed in life. Um, I wanted to share with the house the purpose I had in running and in serving this chamber. I know Representative Winkler told us five minutes, so I, he's not here, so I'm going beyond that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, in listening to Representative Liebling's uh, HHS committee earlier this year, I learned that over 190 babies are born in Minnesota every day. And today, somewhere in Minnesota, a young parent will hold their own child for the first time. I share with you all, there was once a young man of 21 who was born in a land far away. His mother gave birth to him to the sound of artillery fire, bombing, and exploding rockets. That following new year of his birth, his home city was taken over by enemy forces. He grew up in poverty deep in the jungle mountains, never even seeing what a motorcycle looked like. At the age of 12, he had to take up his father's rifle to kill his first man to save his family after his country was taken over by genocidal tyranny. At age 14, he had to join a band of rebels carrying a gun that was too big for his own body, roving through deep in the jungles for months, fighting and trying to escape to a better land. He lived as an orphan for six years in the refugee camps like a prisoner. All around him, women and children dying from hunger, starvation, disease, and broken dreams. 
some of the same experiences that those in Ukraine are going through right now. He finally was given the opportunity to come to a magical land called America. When he arrived, he was unskilled, lacked the language proficiency, it had no education. Some here in this country didn't want him here, telling him to go back, as they said, go back to his country. And for him, he just brushed it all off. He made, I, I looked it up, he made $4.50 an hour in 1992. And sometimes even if one of his child was sick or at, was hospitalized at times, he could not leave his work because he could get fired. Waking up diligently for over 20 years at 6 a.m. every morning, he prayed oddly that he hopes he never receives a promotion for he understood that when that happens with his lack of education and skills, his salary would become too high and he would be worried that he would lose his job and be unable to feed his eight children. But I tell you, none of the hardships, none of the discrimination that he endured, and none of the slights that he received all throughout his life mattered. None of it mattered the day he went to Ramsey County Hospital, or they call it Regions now, two blocks from here, because for on that day at Regions in 1990, he held his firstborn child. And on that day, he saw in his boy's eyes nothing different from what your mother or father saw in yours when they held you for the first time. That is the story of my father. He saw all the hopes and dreams he once had for himself, some hopes going beyond his own station in life. And his heart burned with hope that everything that took the wrong turn in his life would go right for his child. And all the opportunities he never had, his child will be able to obtain. Maybe even a seat here in this chamber. He believed in America. He believed in what President Clinton once said, that what was wrong with America will be fixed with what is right with America. And America's journey towards justice begins in laboratories of America, which is right here in Minnesota, right here in this chamber. You all have the ability to make America a better place for all who lives within our shores. That was why I ran, and that is why I leave with great hope for all of you who are remaining here. Uh, now with my final words to this chamber, I've never pretended to be a great House of Representatives kind of man, but I can only pay the highest respect and compliment by saying that from the first to the very final time today, walking through those, those front doors, I've never stopped fearing it. And the butterflies that I felt two minutes to the start of session today, I, I felt such as much on the very first day of session four years ago, right before minority leader doubt started grilling us Democrats. <laughs> and it is in that fear of this chamber's aura and the history that I, the respect and humility is contained. And the very final thing I want to say about politics in general is that to my colleagues of both political parties and all the staff that had to listen to all our long speeches, um, some may belittle politics, but for those of us who are engaged in it, this is where people stand tall. But for, uh, for, and although it has its harsh realities, and it is still the arena that sets the heartbeat a little faster, as uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair had once said. And if it is on occasion the place for partisanship, it is more often the place for the pursuit of noble and just causes. And with that, friend or foe, I wish you well and thank you for having me here. And it is an honor to sit among you as a member of this House of Representatives. Thank you.
The member from Goodhue, Representative Haley. Representative Jong, that's a hard act to follow. Uh, it's been an honor for me to serve House District 21A in the community of Red Wing where I was born and raised. Um, I have tremendous gratitude for the people who placed me here and all the trust and confidence that they give when they mark that uh, ballot. The Mississippi River Valley and the communities around it are a beautiful part of our state, and I, I hope that all of you come visit me. I'd love to host you for a coffee or a glass of wine or a lunch. Red Wing, Lake City, Wabasha, Good U, Cannon Falls. Uh, these are communities that hold the values of faith and family and hard work and just helping their neighbors. And I hope that I have upheld those values for them here in this chamber. I came here six years ago with a pretty simple goal, to be a servant leader. And to me, that is, translates doing good work for good people and with good people. I hope that through my work here, I've helped secure the economic vitality of these small rural communities that I serve by working on riverfront development and improving our ports, uh, by supporting places like the National Eagle Center and re renovations to the historic Sheldon Theater. I hope that my work to keep quality health care close to home will ensure that our heirs and our community can continue to raise their families in rural Minnesota. I particularly loved working on legislation to support students and our future workforce. And I have a passion for business, both large and small, and particularly the manufacturing community that makes up my part of the state. I could have never have guessed that we would be navigating a pandemic these past two years. But I hope that I was an effective champion for them as we worked our way through that. Uh, being a legislator, one part that a lot of people outside of this place don't see is the work that we all do for our constituents. And I just have gratitude for all of those good people who reached out to my office and shared their stories. Sometimes small things, sometimes major, major things in their lives. And they were reaching out to say, can you help? Can you just help government work better for me and my family? I just want to just publicly say thank you to all of them, and I won't forget their stories. And finally, I've been privileged to do good work with good people. I cannot say enough. About all of you. All of you. You are amazing, and you show up here every single day with the commitment to do the right thing for this state. And I honor each and every one of you for that. In particular, I have to call out my LA. I know there's lots of people to thank. But uh, Doreen Kynes, when I'd be in my district, people would say to me, Barb, you really got the A team. And then they'd say, isn't Doreen here? I'm like, well, what about me? <laughs> they wanted Doreen. She is a force, so talented. And I have been blessed by all of her skills and her friendship. And finally, I want to thank my husband, Tim, and my children, Joey and Maria. Maria is in the chamber today. <laughs> we all know that it takes a lot from our families for us to do this work. I want to leave you with one last thought. I had the opportunity on Saturday to, um, during our recess, to go to the commissioning ceremony for the USS Minneapolis-St. Paul. This was the first time that a naval ship had been commissioned in our state. And I did not know that each naval ship uh, has a motto that their crew uh, decides on. And this was on Saturday, and Saturday was the day that I announced my retirement from these chambers, and I thought it was pretty apropos. Their motto was, is, we will either find a way or make one. And when they commissioned that ship, all of those hundred naval officers stood in front of the ship, and the commanding officer said, we will either find a way, and they all shouted out, or make one. So I encourage all of you not to give up on finding a way to make our communities better and our state better. And even when those ways and those paths before you get very difficult. Have the tenacity and the courage to make one. Thank you. Thank you for how you've blessed my life and carry on.
member from Ramsey, Representative Her, for what purpose do you rise? Madam Speaker, I rise for the purpose of acknowledging that uh, we do have a, Thai, a Hmong Thai dignitary here today visiting from Thailand, and I just wanted to share that he is one of the uh, p uh, first person of Hmong descent to be elected uh, in uh, the Thai government, and very fitting after uh, Representative Tu Zhang's um, uh, speech, his retirement speech from the House today, that uh, we too are still making first in countries we've been in in a while. So I wanted to just, he's up in the gallery, and wanted to just uh, give him uh, some acknowledgement that he is here today. The member from Washington, Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Working in the Minnesota House of Representatives has been an honor and a privilege of a lifetime. I still remember the first day being sworn in, walked into my office, and laying on my desk was a name tag that said, Minnesota House of Representatives, Tony Jurgens, And I, I remember the, the pride that I felt. I put that pin on. A little bit later, I ran into Representative Albright. And Tony said, take that button, take that off. You don't need to wear that. Everybody knows who you are now. And I thought, wow, that was, that was pretty cool. But then I remembered about five months prior to that, I was at a a fundraiser, GOP fundraiser, and this tall guy came up to me, you know, silver hair, very professional looking, deep voice. He said, how's your campaign going? I said, good. He said, you need anything? I said, no, not that I can think of. He said, you know how to get a hold of me if you need anything, right? And I hesitated, I wasn't quite sure how to say it. And finally, I just said, I don't know who you are. <laughs> and that was Tony Albright. <laughs> Representative Albright, thank you for those kind words and everything that you've done. You know, I could spend a lot of time thanking people here, just naming names. Um, we don't have that kind of time. The privilege of this job has been the people the people in my community, Hastings and Cottage Grove, that I've gotten, had the opportunity to represent, to help. You know, people have asked me, well, what do you like about the job? And, you know, there might be some legislative wins, uh, big things, small things, but honestly, what I've really enjoyed about this job is helping people. It might be something simple, just helping a, a, a resident or constituent navigate the state system, get a call back from a department. Um, sometimes it's, it's bigger issues that you know you have an impact on, but those aren't the things that we put on social media, that we talk about publicly and name names because of private, private matters that you know you made a difference in. We're the voice of those people, whether during COVID it's the, the local florists or marinas or movie theaters, and of course, bars and restaurants. They reach out to us and expect the us to be their voice. I've had the opportunity to represent terrific communities, Hastings, Cottage Grove, and Afton. And I have to admit this job has been a lot less fun the last two plus years with so much of it being remote like I am today. The real benefit of this job is being part of a team, a cohesive team. None of us could do the jobs without the, the help of the staff. Um, I've had six different legislative assistants in my time in the House, Micah Olson, Nicole Abraham, Josh Solano twice, Mark Nicely twice, Maddie Wallace, and currently Rebecca Reiners. They make us look good. They're the front lines when our constituents call, when they come in, when they email. We couldn't do our our jobs without the, the staff that we have behind us. My media writer, Jason Wenish, is gonna be mad because he likes to fly under the radar, but not only has he been a terrific 
media writer for me, he has grown into and has long been my number one top political advisor on anything. Anything that I have uh, that I'm wondering about, he's the guy I run it by. And he has been a tremendous help for me, gone way over and above being uh, a staff member and it truly has become a terrific friend. Thank you, Jason. And none of us could do this without our families. My wife, Dawn, my daughter, Alexa, and her husband, Tony, their twins, Walker and Charline, who have each had the opportunity to spend a little time with grandpa on the house floor, Walker, just the other day. And my daughter, Tori, and her husband, Tyler. Families sacrifice a lot for us to do the job. And I can't thank them enough for all that they've done for me. The sergeant's office, Bob Meyerson, Andrew, Orhe, Brian, Jim, Lori, the chief clerk's office, Pat Murphy, um, Gail, Paul Hicks, and all of your, your staff, um, House GOP staff. I, there's too many names and I'll forget someone, but Amy Zipko, Bobby Patrick, Brian Cook, Jonathan Fortner, Josh Anderson over the years. Um, you've all helped us be able to do the job uh, that we're doing. Uh, of course, I never would have gotten my start without my predecessor, rep pre predecessor Representative Denny McNamara. I uh, can't thank him enough as well. You know, one thing that I've always said, or in recent years anyway, is that someday I will be a former state representative. And it really didn't matter to me when that is, whether I would choose not to run, lose an election, or of course die. None of us are going to be doing this forever. And uh, while my time in the House is ending, I'm not sure what my future is, um, but I want to thank everybody that I've worked with, uh, the pride that I have felt walking into that building, walking into that chamber, and doing the people's work. Um, it's something, definitely something that will be missed, and I want to thank all of you for being part of that experience. Thank you. The member from St. Louis, Representative Schultz. Thank you, everyone. Um, it feels really strange to be giving a retirement speech when... Sorry, <laughs> um, when the work isn't done. So, you know, and also, um, um, it's strange because HHS is never done, <laughs> as you all know. Um, but we work until, I believe, the start of the next session. So we're not really retiring, especially Team HHS. But um, um, our work is never done here. But I think all of us believe that we have. <laughs> we all do our best when we all want to do things that are good for the people of Minnesota. And Team HHS does that every day. And I want to thank everybody um, for working across the aisle. And I, um, I can work with anyone, I think, in this chamber, everyone from Tina Liebling, um, very diverse opinions to, I don't even know if I want to say his name, but Jeremy Munson. Um, on issues because we can find common ground and that this eight years of experience has been very helpful working the entire eight years in divided legislature and it's been a great learning experience for me. In fact, so great that this body wasn't large enough for me and I am going to be running, I'm running for office uh, for a different chamber and I'm going to, I wasn't planning on giving a retirement speech because of course we've been working many days on HHS and you don't sleep a lot the last week of session. I'm working on HHS and I was just gonna stand up and say, I'm gonna give my retirement speech in special session. 
Uh, so I hope we have one, because right now it also feels strange because I'm still negotiating the HHS bill with the Senate. So our work is not done. Um, I can give a more complete retirement speech when I'm actually uh, done with our work here, which is so important for the people of Minnesota, as you all know, and I know all believe, but we just remember that. Um, I'm leaving here knowing that um, things are in good hands with Chair Liebling and HHS and all of you. And um, I'll give a better speech when I'm not tired and we're in special session um, and um, we have a deal on HHS. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> The member from Candy, Ohio, Representative Miller. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, thank you for this opportunity for me to say goodbye. It's been an honor to serve with all of you and with all those who I've served during my eight years here. And I did want to say for the staff here, the nonpartisan staff, the partisan staff, the staff in my own office, there really are not better people that I've ever met in my lifetime. The selfless, the selfless work that you do, the um, servant attitude that you have, uh, the patience with us are just second to none. And I don't think we could ever thank you enough. So thank you for the work that you've done. The first time I work, walked into this room, my breath was taken away by all that it represents. A very average person like me had the honor to belong and to have a voice. It's proof of both God's great blessings and proof that we live in the greatest country this world has ever seen, that someone like me could actually serve in such a great capacity. I thought long and hard about what I should say here. I want to honor this great institution with my words and leave you all with a blessing for your work ahead. I've decided the best way to do this is to share excerpts from a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the Roman Church. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Just for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do so diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. 
If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will, keep, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority but that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For the rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. That is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the constituting debt to love one another. Forever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the, rep the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the seeds of dark. Let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Goodbye and bless you all. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Carleton, Representative Sundin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just a few reflections here. Uh, growing up, I enjoyed the writings of uh, a fellow by the name of Patrick F. McManus. He was a humorist, uh, centered most of his work around uh, outdoor uh, life, that type of thing, and really enjoyed his work. And uh, in his last book, he uh, t entitled How I Got This Way. Uh, he reflected on the strong women that sh uh, shaped his life, uh, his, his mother, his loving wife, and his sister he re referred to as the troll. Okay. And uh, like, like him, I was fortunate to have uh, uh, powerful women to help me lay the path uh, to St. Paul. For me, it was uh, Some darn good uh, public uh, education teachers, uh, Edith Watson, my mother, a community activist. But even with their support, it seemed that there's always someone in my way, someone stopping me to get to St. Paul. Decades ago, I was determined to run for the legislature, but my representative, Mary Murphy, wouldn't retire. <laughs> So if not for redistricting in 2012, I would still be sitting home waiting. Okay. That said, it's been a ride of a lifetime with you, Mary. Okay. Uh, I take a lot of pride in the work that we've done here in St. Paul. Uh, my work uh, for the labor movement, I'm, I'm so proud. The, because of my contributions and others, uh, there's hundreds of thousands of Minnesota workers, maybe millions, by the time this is all said and done, 
that will have good wages, good benefits, secure retirements. I'm very, very proud of that. And believe me, uh, my service on the Ag Committee, Minnesota Agriculture is in a better place because of my efforts, the efforts of Vice Chair Vang, and the hard work of a dedicated committee. I'm very, very proud of the work that we've done. But uh, I've enjoyed so many special friendships. I'm not going to start naming names. You know who you are, right? Okay. But uh, I've enjoyed so many of these friendships. Severing ties in, uh, in the legislature and leaving St. Paul has not been an easy decision, but uh, toughest of all is severing the living arrangements with uh, Representative Eklund, you know. <laughs> uh, we, we went around and around, but uh, I, I propose that uh, I take the TV and the toaster oven, <laughs> Rob gets the kids. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I really couldn't have asked for more. You know, thank you, everyone, so much. I'm going to leave you with uh, some profound words from uh, my favorite doctor, Dr. Seuss. <laughs> so let's not cry because it's over. Let's smile because it happened. Thank you. The member from Stearns, Representative Tice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. First of all, I want to make sure that you know who's retiring today. My name is Tama Tice. That is Deb Keel. Even though. <laughs> even though somebody has changed our names. <laughs> I have to tell you that in December of 2019, Deb and I and our husbands and, and the speaker and some other folks, Representative Elkins, traveled to Israel. And I pre-warned Greg, I said, some people do confuse us. And he's like, yeah, whatever. Well, I went down to breakfast one morning. He comes running over to me and he said, I'm gonna, not going to say what he said, but Go ahead. I almost grabbed Deb in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how the trip started. <laughs> It was a wonderful time. I woke up on Friday, January 5th, not having a clue how my world would change that day. My representative, Steve Gottwald, had announced that he was going to be retiring and getting a real job. And uh, by 4 o'clock that afternoon, I was running, and I had no clue. Like, we're talking no clue what this meant. But I said yes. I trusted God that this is where I belonged. And I often relied on Esther 414. You were born for such a time as this. And I hold that to me very often when things are challenging and frustrating, and then when they're absolutely wonderful. But now it's time for me to move on. I walked into this wonderful building for five terms to do the work I was elected to do. I remember walking in with Representative Hoppy, one of the first days that I was here. And I always had, I always had somebody that was showing me where to go because I was going to get lost. I had no orientation. I came in in a special. It was, uh, it was such a learning curve, you guys. It was just amazing. And anybody who came in in a special knows that. It is an incredible learning curve. But uh, my first LA, Gavin Hansen. Oh. oh. I take full responsibility for the wonderful man he is. <laughs> because he is fully responsible for the representative that I am today. He held my hand. He held me when I cried. And then he told me to put my big girl pants on. <laughs> It has been a wonderful ride. 
And then I sat next to Representative Swazinski, who I had known in the early 2000s, and they put me next to him. I learned that I have to think for myself, not to believe everything he tells me. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I did avoid some shenanigans because I asked too many questions. Finally, he'd just say, fine, this is what's going on. <laughs> but thank you. It's challenging to enter this world as in a, from a special election, but I think it made me such a better representative because of it. I've learned to be very versatile, to roll with the flow, to do what I've been asked to do. I do have to tell you that one of the first times, well, the first time I met Representative Torkelson, he informed me that Representative Gutwalt was his roommate, and he now had an empty bedroom. And I, I can't tell you how much that made me feel at home, because I'm used to being with guys. <laughs> I've always lived with guys. I've never lived with women. So uh, in a way, it was kind of comforting, but it was not going to happen. <laughs> but it was, it was just so much a part of how it's been. I have been so blessed. And it didn't take me long to realize that the journey here was in the works for quite a while. And I'm always that one that'll say, hey, you know, Greg, did you notice this? This is how it's, God's working? And he's like, yep, uh-huh. This was one time where he said, this has been happening for a long time. And he was right. I had completed personal coach training. So I am a certified coach. And uh, did that for a couple years. And then I also realize the wisdom of the four agreements, and that's another thing that really shaped who I am and what I do and how I make decisions. I'm going to tell you the first agreement is be impeccable with your word. The second agreement is don't take anything personally. That's probably the hardest one sometimes, especially in this job. The next one is don't make assumptions. So unless I hear it, I'm not going to assume anything. And always do your best. Number four, always do your best. And I've tried to do that in every aspect of my life. I think what I think about a lot right now is Carol Burnett and how she used to end her shows. I'm so glad we had this time together. Just to have a laugh or sing a song. Seems we just got started. And before you know it, comes the time we have to say goodbye. But I'm not saying goodbye. I want to thank you so much for enriching my life. The memories are amazing. The sweaters that look like Afghans. Are you on your phone, Nathan? <laughs> <laughs> sweaters that look like Afghans. <laughs> Tolerating all my hugs and my tears for being such a girl in the group of my guys. And so much more. It's hard to put 10 years of memories into just a couple minutes. I have so much love in my heart for this chamber and all those that I see every time I'm here. Everybody. I've never felt so safe in a place. It has been, you know, everybody told me when I came in, it's going to be the best time ever. And some days you're going to feel like it's the worst times ever. But it truly is the best times ever. Thank you so much for the memories. Thank you so much for the work. Thank you so much for how you grew me to be a better person. Thank you. The member from Scott, Representative Albright.
Madam Speaker, thank you. I thought I would start with thank yous so that I don't forget anyone. And the list is uh, somewhat long, so it's alphabetical, and I'll apologize in advance if I've ever forgotten anyone. Chelsea Axelson, Janelle Bulka, Susan Klausma, Lori Cozano, Rachel Eason, Perry Glessing, Gavin Hansen, John Haltquist, Harry Kennedy, Mark Laliberti, or as I call him lovingly, Kenny, <laughs> Callie Lehman, Joe Marble, Mark Nisley, Casey Peterson, Andrew Wagner, the indomitable Jeremiah Wingstead, Jody Withers, Troy Young, and Amy Zipko. You've heard it really often this morning, but it is without question, the people that I just mentioned make us better than we are. Because each of you are the very best this state has to offer. Oh, I might have remembered a few more people. Steve Munoz. I can remember the first session that I served. I'm like a former member. I use pencils. I like a specific kind of pencil. And I went down to Steve one day and I said, do you got anything more than a number two? And he said, well, what do you need? And I said, I need a number three HD. He said, I can take care of that. <laughs> Within two days, I had 25 number three HD pencils to do my bidding on this in this chamber. Annie Paracini. We are partners in crime. And we do love a party. <laughs> Mr. Meyerson, thank you for being the guardian of all who enter through those doors. You have always had our back. Thank you. Patrick Duffy Murphy. Everyone has their first inclination and in, in introduction to the chief clerk, and I've served under three. Two, sorry. But as a freshman, when you walk in and you take your seat and you hear your name called, for the first time. It doesn't get any more real than that. And I'm sorry, but you've called my name a lot, <laughs> as well as everyone in this chamber. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I couldn't be more humbled by your service to this state. Also, the keeper of my legacy. Keep it in good stead. Thank you. 
just like everyone else in this chamber, I have been blessed with people that have dressed me up and patted me on the head and sent me into committee hoping that I didn't screw up. <laughs> no more so than my L.A. Mrs. Coddington. You have been my guardian, you have been my confidant, you have been the parent in the room, <laughs> you have been my partner in crime, my schemer, and you have been my partner on this road. I owe you a debt of gratitude. You can't do this journey alone, and I have been blessed with a wife and family who at times have kidded me about being a legislator. Early on in my first term, I came home, and my son Joseph, who you've met, brought in the mail. And he's going through it, and we're all standing around the island in the kitchen, and he's saying, you know, Mom, Laura, Anna, Mom, Laura. And he says, oh, here's a good one. And he holds it up, and he said, oh, this is addressed to the Honorable Tony Albright. <laughs> to which thunderous applause, because in my household, when you walk in the door after a day on the legislative floor, the first thing that you're reminded of is that you have a family that loves you. And I can't honestly say how I could love my wife any more today than I do for what she has supported and allowed me to do as one of my dreams in my life over the last 10 years. Thank you, Marianne. You know, you don't have any idea in terms of how big of a deal this is going to be until you start uh, thinking about the people who have come through those doors before you. And you start to get a little more nervous as you start to grapple with what you've been a part of. In other areas of your life, you can hide. But in this chamber, you are front and center. The old saying goes, it's nothing personal. It's just business. Whoever says that's never been a legislator. <laughs> because you are the embodiment of every person living in your district and in this state. It's personal. Many have said that making legislation is either utopia or shoveling shit uphill. <laughs> well, I guess today we're going to put away our shovels and we're going to remember the good times. And for me, I've had many. I can honestly say that in my 10 years, I've witnessed some historic milestones while serving in this chamber. Not only by the direction that legislation that we've passed has taken this state, <coughs> but also by the transformation of this building itself. From some of us, who could forget walking through the tunnel while it was under construction? 
with jackhammers and wheelbarrows and emergency lights and plastic and ramps and detours. We're using the outdoor bathrooms <laughs> in the middle of a thunderstorm. And for some of us, who could forget convening floor <laughs> session in room 10 of the state office building? To say things got steamy <laughs> that day weren't kidding. We've also witnessed the ebb and flow of life amongst each other, haven't we? We've celebrated the joy of new life, new beginnings, but also the heartbreak of tragedy, illness, and the loss of members and loved ones. Everyone knows that this day will come for them. For some, maybe it's coming sooner than they expected. Maybe not soon enough by others. But it is a day that marks the close of an experience very few in this state ever have the privilege to call their own. So much so that in the whole of our state's existence, only 5,400 individuals have walked through those doors, sat down at these desks, and cast a vote to affect the lives of every Minnesotan. And not just for that day, but for generations to come. Everyone has their story of how they came to be inspired by someone who said something or at just the right moment pointed you in a direction that led you to this desk. I almost became a senator. I know. <laughs> Calm your fears, I got over it real fast. But one of my dearest friends is Senator Eric Pratt. We came in together. He and I were running for the same seat because just the day before, our senator, Claire Roebling, had decided not to run. And so in the space of a 30-second conversation on I-494, right under France Avenue, his campaign manager and my campaign manager told each other, get the candidates on the phone and figure this out because the House seat had also just opened up. So in the space of 30 seconds, Senator Pratt said, what do you want to be? I, being a card player, I said, no, what do you want to be? <laughs> he said, I want to be a senator. I said, OK. And then the shaky voice comes back. He'll lie about that part. Uh, he said, what do you want to be? I said, I want to be a representative. And he said, see you tomorrow. <laughs> it's been a long journey since that day in January of 2013 when I took the oath of office on this floor. And though my hair has turned gray and my hearing is not as good as it used to be, my heart is full. I've had the pleasure of serving with you, and I sincerely mean that, and that in, in, in some small way, each one of you has added lines in one of the most amazing chapters in my book of life. And so I end 
as it always begins when you rise to speak on this floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. This is a tough one for me. The member from Ramsey, Representative Moran. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. And Representative Tice, I just want to say, I, like you, try to live by the four agreements. Ah, what an honor and a privilege it is to be on this House floor. Twelve years later, I know and I feel that honor and that privilege every single day. For the past 12 years has been incredible. I want to thank everyone in District 65A for their support over the years. Our neighborhood has challenges, but we are resilient. And we have the immigrants and the people of color who are looking to achieve the American dream, to start families, to own a small business, with neighbors who deeply care about one another. The support over the years has been humbling. When my family and I first arrived in Minnesota 22 years ago, homeless and jobless, I never imagined in my wildest dream that I would be on this House floor. In this breathtaking chamber, when days are hard and tough and I just look up and just look at just how beautiful it is and remember the role that we have to play here, that I have to play here for my community for the people, for real people back in my district. So I want to thank uh, my very first campaign manager and friend who just became a father two days ago. You know who you are. The volunteers and my neighbors for seeing something in me that I didn't see, that I was not sure of. Yes, this mother of seven kids did not see this. And to all the other campaign managers and awesome volunteers and friends for supporting me over the last six terms, I could not have done this without you. I want to thank my family for their support and understanding through all the ups and downs and long nights and weekends and never ending meetings and phone calls that comes with serving in this office. I could not have done this without you. I know, you know, this would probably be a common thing throughout the day. If not, you know, I know I cannot go for, for it without thanking the staff here. I can't thank you enough. I want to thank my legislative assistants, Jerry Boyce. Jerry Boyce, when I first came in my first year, Jerry didn't take no stuff, did she? Jerry, <laughs> Jerry was leading the way, but you know, she, she saw me coming and she had it laid out. Before I got sworn in, she was making phone calls to me, giving me the feel for what it was, could be and was going to be. So Jerry, love you, Jerry. Travis Reese, Mike Moner, Connor McNutt, Ben Takati, Alicia Fritz, uh, Alicia, Fr uh, Alicia Fritz. Um, we miss you, Alyssa. 
uh, Jazz D'Amiglio, Laura Sparkman, and Anna Borgidine, plus Chris McCall and Nancy Conley, who were my committee administrators these four years, these past four years. And Chris Connor, um, uh, Chris McCall, I just want to say thank you. If anyone knows Chris McCall, you know he knows how to navigate this place from the House to the Senate, the issues, he knows it back and forth. Also, um, we're not and cannot leave out the sergeant's office, um, our chief clerk, staff, thank you, our IT people, constituent services, media, public information, and everyone else who make this place run so smoothly. We could not do this work without you. I want to particularly thank the research and fiscal staff who have been absolutely invaluable to me as a committee chair. They are the brightest and smartest people in the world. And I hope you guys get to get some sleep real soon. <laughs> I want to thank my colleagues for their contribution to their communities and to our state. We do difficult work here and everyone brings something to the table, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But we bring it. We bring what we have to give. I deeply value your wisdom and your friendship. Madam Speaker, I want to thank you. When Representative Lyndon Carson stepped down, I know he left a big shoe to fill. And I will, and still am, internally grateful for the trust that you placed in me with the honor of serving as committee chair of Ways and Means. What an honor. Thank you. I know it meant a lot for my community to have a woman of color. No, no. To have a black woman in such a big role. And so, I just cannot thank you enough. I also want to thank those on the other side of the aisle who I've had the opportunity to work with closely, some more than others, but Representative Albright, Representative Cresha. We were able to get some good work, do some good work together. And I value your friendship and your partnership. And Representative Garofalo, now, we know your passion, and we're familiar with the, bomb, the bombast that you often bring here to the House floor. So I wasn't exactly sure what to expect when we started our journey together on Ways and Means. While we didn't always agree, I want to thank you for being a cooperative counterpart as the GOP, as the GOP leads on Ways and Means. Some of my colleagues on this side of the aisle might not like hearing this, um, but you are a valuable, a valuable member of this institution. And I appreciate that. To my DFL colleagues, thank you, each one of you, for your caring, for your passion. <laughs> Jay is like, enough, enough. For your passion, for your love of the people, to see them across the state of Minnesota and to work on their behalf. Because making government work for all is really important. And that's what we do as a party. We too often throw around the word stakeholders. Let's all instead worry about how the actions we take here impact people. The people who aren't representative here with lobbyists. The people whom voices are too often are not represented, are not represented in this political process. Like P. 
people experiencing homelessness. People who don't know when they will have the next meal. Children stuck in our child protection system and their families who just want some hope. People who get sick or hurt and don't know how they will pay a medical bill. We might, might not always want to hear their voices at the committee table, but they deserve a space in the halls of government. And I am so proud to have been able to bring those voices from my district into this body. I used to say to my constituents that um, my district is so close to the Capitol that we can touch it. But so often we don't see it because we don't feel that government is working for us, that government is for us. And I spent a lot of time saying to my, my neighbors is that, you know what? You're going to get uncomfortable to get comfortable. And that has been my life journey through this process. Every step of the way to become uncomfortable, <laughs> to get comfortable and do the work of the people, to do the work of my district. I also hope this body can continue to focus on and make meaningful progress to address the systemic racism that's too prevalent in our states. Our select committee on racial justice did a comprehensive work to not just examine the causes of systemic racism, but solution that we can take right now to improve opportunities for BIPOC communities. Because government has not always worked for us. There's no condemnation, it's just what it is. So I want to thank Representative Richardson for her partnership in putting together our select committee report. It was one of the single most powerful documents in the history of our body. I truly believe that, and I hope you guys can receive that. And it's too important for us to simply remain, for it to simply remain archived up in the reference library and forgotten. Please, to everyone who is coming back, we know the entire package of recommendations wouldn't be enacted overnight. We know this process takes time, years sometimes, most of the time. But too much work remains to be done, and I hope you all can take them seriously as you approach the important work in this body. We all have a role to play, in my mind, to make the lives of people better. Because at the end of the day, we just want to be self-sufficient and able to take care of ourselves and our family and to become a contributing members of the community. But government has a role there, too, to make that happen, or not. Finally, emotions often run high here. We all come with our individual passions and expertise and ideas. Let's all commit to being kind, patient with one another. The person who yells the loudest doesn't necessarily have the best ideas. Let's learn to listen more and talk less. People really have something to deliver to this body about how we can make and improve the work that we do, especially those who have been impacted by systems. To one another and to our communities, let's find ways to eliminate hate. And for those God-fearing people in this body, the one thing I do believe that we believe is that God is love. Let's show some of that.
As some of you may know, um, I do hope to continue my public service, but in a different role that would probably bring me back here to see you from time to time. <laughs> But serving in the Minnesota House of Representatives was an experience unlike anything else in this world. And I could not have imagined not doing this and being part of this process. And despite the difficulties along the way, I would look back and I would savor every moment, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Folks, <laughs> it really has been an honor to be here and to be a part of your lives in some type of way. And to my community, again, I just say thank you. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you, uh, uh, in some ways, as this outsider who wasn't born and raised here to bring in your voices into this place and to bring you into this body and to see that government has a role to make our lives better and you have a story to tell. It is because of you that I am who I am. Madam Speaker, Majority Leader, our minority leaders, our whips, our members, You are incredible. You are all incredible people. I just want to say thank you. Thank you to everyone, and thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Sibley, Representative Grunhagen. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, yeah, I woke up Saturday morning with a head cold, and uh, that's why I haven't been on the floor the last few days. It's quite a bit better today, but uh, uh, just want to let you know that. I guess it is kind of fitting that I speak after Representative Moran, because her and I came in together, and I've uh, appreciated her perspective on issues, although we haven't always agreed. Uh, I'd like to start also by thanking my previous LAs and my current LAs, especially Cindy. They've just done a great job of uh, trying to make me look better. And I know they've had their hands full at times. <laughs> uh, I also want to thank my wife for her support and prayers and uh, her faithfulness in uh, holding down the home fires and uh, encouraging and supporting me as a state representative. You know, I've had a lot of memorial, memorable uh, moments uh, at the House of Representatives. I'll concentrate on just one. And that one happens to involve Majority uh, Leader uh, Ryan Winkler. Um, uh, quite a few sessions ago, the first time it came up, uh, it had bipartisan support to pass national popular vote, which I strongly oppose because it, it would move us to a mob democracy versus a, a republic based on God-given rights. After it was presented on a bipartisan basis, I got up and uh, I kind of blasted it as unconstitutional and contrary to the founding principles of our country. Uh, when I sat down, the next speaker was uh, Representative Winkler. And I always remember his words because they uh, tickled my fancy quite a bit. He started off by saying, I find myself in the awkward position of agreeing with Representative Glenn Gruhagen, however, for, with different, uh, for different reasons. And in the end, uh, we were able to defeat the national popular vote uh, 
coming forward. And I even had one longtime Democratic member come up to me afterwards and said, Glenn, you're the great uniter. You brought the extreme left and the extreme right together to defeat NPV. <laughs> so that's one of the uh, memories I'll always have uh, having served in the House. Secondly, uh, one of the things I want to leave you with is we can't grow government faster than population in the private sector. You know, when, when you grow government from uh, uh, 2010 at 29 billion general fund to over 52 billion, that's over a 75% growth rate. And when you grow government faster than the private sector, regardless of your intentions, you do more damage than good because obviously the private sector has to carry the weight of the cost of government. So we do have to have a governor because requests are unlimited. And I would seriously encourage both sides of the aisle to seriously think about putting a governor. I brought an amendment forward, we didn't vote on it, but it would restrain government growth and spending based on population and economic growth. Remember, we need to leave something behind for our children and grandchildren. And I believe this will create a better Minnesota for all, for all of us going forward. Another area that I want to be clear on, just in case anybody's confused, I do not believe in climate change or global warming, okay? Uh, I think it's an unscientific UN scam, and I will continue to oppose it. Uh, the, the other thing I'd leave you with is that, you know, in the 90s, they cracked the genetic code and do your research. And what they found, there was no gene that could cause uh, uh, one animal to change into another animal. What that means is we are one race, the human race. Now, we're different ethnic groups, but that does mean that you're all related to me which I know that gives some of you heartburn, but that happens to be the scientific and biological fact. Uh, remember the words of John Adams, one of our founding fa fathers. Our constitution was made only for a moral and a religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. You know, as far as your ranking in my life's experience, I would say the state representative is be, is ahead of my school board ex experience, but it's behind my jail ministry experience, okay? So uh, that's kind of where it fits in. And uh, I do have one request, Madam Chair, and you know, I've been in a lot of divisive meetings in my political career and public uh, service career. I know that's kind of hard for some of you to believe, but that, that has been the case. But one of the things I found is that at the end of a meeting, if we sang, uh, regardless of our differences, if we sang God Bless America, uh, it tended to have a unifying effect on all of us. So I would ask, Madam Chair, that at the end of these testimonies on retirement, that the House would sing God Bless America and if possible, Representative Keel would lead us off. Um, with that, members, God bless you. And uh, I've enjoyed getting to know each and every one of you. And let's pray that God will bless our state and nation and that we can again build a better future for our children and grandchildren. Thank you. The member from Anoka, Representative Bernardi. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. It's an honor to be able to say goodbye, wish you the best, and to you and to your families. It has been an honor serving in the legislature, and I just want to share a little bit about going back on the journey that started with my parents. My dad grew up in Walnut Grove on the banks of Plum Creek. He used to say he used to play with Laura. He had no running water, no electricity. They were sharecroppers. And uh, he and my mom met when they were teenagers, and they became uh, teenage wed parents. And um, 
move to the cities to look for a job and have a better life after they graduated from high school. My mom went back to work when I was about seven years old, and she, um, her boss said, you know, you're really smart, you should go to college. So she quit work and she went to college. She was the top female freshman of her in her class, and she went on to earn her two-year RN nursing degree. She later earned her four-year bachelor's degree in nursing, and then later earned her master's degree in occupational health. My dad worked really hard. They both worked in factories. He worked about 55 hours a week, oftentimes, Monday through Saturday. And um, they, we loved the outdoors and loved to travel, and we would be packed up on right after when my dad was getting off work and the bell would go off, and uh, we would head for uh, the great uh, northern part of the state and fish and hunt and a camp and all those things. My mom and dad, we later found out, they b both worked in factories in our community that I represent now, and found out that those uh, facilities were contaminated. So I share these stories with you because as I come here as a legislator, those stories come with me. My mom, had little, my mom and dad had little more than faith, hope, in the, and um, the courage to pursue their American dream. And they um, instilled in me hard work. They instilled in me the value of education as, as well as my community did. The, learned about the importance of clean water and our environment, and the um, importance of teamwork in helping each other. So coming here in the legislature, before I started, our schools were in need of more funding, and they were going to have to cut music, FIAD, art, and the, those kinds of uh, really important programs for students' development. And so being that my career has been creating community partnerships and bringing people together, I brought together a bipartisan group of parents, teachers, senior citizens in our community, and students. And this was back in 1999. You, some of you may have been here. Um, we fought for and we won needed funding down here at the legislature. It was a group I started called Save Our Schools. And um, with that, my legislator retired, Alice Johnson, and people asked me to run for the seat. And of course, I said no. I had no intention or that wasn't in my plans. I said no a second time. And then my parents had retired the year before, sold everything at 56 and 57 years old, had um, sold, uh, bought a motor home, and they traveled the country. And my parents said, we'll come back in the summer, and while you're campaigning, we'll help take care of the kids. And uh, my husband did a lot of traveling, and we, um, we thought, well, we'll go on to this adventure together, and that's, that's what we did. So I came to the legislature and served in the minority for six years. And so I learned that you have to work across the aisle if you want to get anything done. And one of the stories, I want to share like three areas in which I talked about the things I brought with me to the Capitol, about the environment, education. And I, didn't, I forgot to tell you, my dad, he um, shares stories with me about when he was a young boy. He, would, he rode bareback in six miles into town um, for t transportation, and um, he, they also um, used a sleigh, the neighbor's sleigh after blizzards, to go in and get, get food. So transportation has changed a lot in my dad's lifetime, and when he worked at a factory, he carpooled, he um, rode his motorcycle, and he biked, and he, at one point, he got hit by a car with a bicycle. And so um, the whole transportation story is intertwined with my work here. So when I got here, we, I was a freshman, and you know how uh, freshmen, especially in my district, was a 50% index district at that time. You don't get things added on to a Republican omnibus bill as a DFL freshman. You know that just doesn't happen. Well, I talked with the chair and I told them what I needed to have happen because my community needed to clean up the wetlands that were, that were being destroyed by pollutants and stormwater at Springbrook Nature Center, which was a, a filter for the Mississippi River right above the intake for water that serves Minneapolis and St. Paul residents. Well, anyway, we, we took the vote and, you know, no one expected it to pass, and by golly, it passed. Republicans came to, um, supported me, and it passed by two votes. So I went in the back retiring room and I was like really excited and Ann Lincheski said, did you hear the gasp out there? That just doesn't happen around here, especially to a freshman. And so then the next thing I know it, they were calling it up for a revote. And I was like, oh my gosh, they're gonna kill my bill. Well, it passed with over 100 votes and we got even more support by, from um, both sides of the aisle. And later what I found out, it happened to be that the year before in the election, I don't know if anybody remembers this, I think Jim Abler's in the Senate, he might remember this, there was, there was, they were called the Toxic 12. 
and people did not want to take a bad vote on clean water. And because of that, I'm able to, um, that, because of bipartisan support, they passed it without, without the threat of the other thing. They passed it first. But it was um, what makes this place work, and it helped my community be able to restore those wetlands. And it was the first urban wetland restoration of its kind in the country. Later on in my legislative service, we were able to get $5 million for the Springbrook Interpretive Center, which I'm, I'm very proud of that's um, serving this regional area. So then I, um, after six years and working really hard and um, trying to get other people to join me that were teachers and cared about the environment, I retired because I didn't want to miss out on my kids' lives. And um, I, the first thing I did was leave the legislature and the next day went to a travel agent and booked a three-week three week trip to Europe with my family. We had the time of our life, and uh, I, I love being off, and I'm so glad I thought I retired for, um, for good, and took in a foreign exchange student from Hong Kong. I, um, after we had her and have a number, a number of students spend with us for the weekend, we had someone in our lives that needed help graduating from high school and had really challenges with learning disabilities. And his wife, his, not his wife, but his mom was a great mom. She had schizophrenia. And so I thought, well, we took in a student for a year across the ocean. Well, why not take a student across the river in North Minneapolis and help him earn his high school degree? So we did that, and then um, we also helped uh, 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 my, my child's, our children's friend, who was a first-generation Liberian, uh, learn about colleges, and I, I got him involved in learning about the university and McAllister College, and my, my family, we didn't go to private colleges, but I used the knowledge I had and the people that I knew to help connect him with those resources, and worked with the school, got him to do his FAFSA, all those things, and he ended up getting a full-ride scholarship to McAllister. So those are the kinds of things that I enjoyed doing and helping my neighbor's daughter. Um, she was indigenous background, had some mental health and uh, learning disabilities, helped her get an EIP. So I know leaving the legislature, there's a lot of rewarding and uh, fun, things, fun things to do. And during that time, I was able to work for Ramsey County, and I was able to get a lot of training on structural racism. And I learned a lot. And when I came back to the legislature in 2012, after redistricting happened, my, di my district was made, was comprised of three other people's districts, and I was, I was able to come back. Unfortunately, this time redistricting uh, made my district three different districts, and it went the other way. So we must be kind of an epic, uh, epicenter, or epic, or I don't know what you would call it, but an area in which um, comes and goes in different ways and, um, during redistricting. So I came back, and I was able to work on equity issues, uh, environmental justice issues, and civil rights issues, especially as it relates to transportation. And I worked bipartisanly across the aisle on asset management. Representative Petersburg has been a big supporter of that work, performance measures, getting the public involved and hearing their voices so that we just don't put um, concrete and make people go faster through people's communities, being able to hear people's voices. And so that um, a lot of things around here happen around laws, but we also can change system and how we do things. And so when uh, MnDOT didn't have an environmental justice program, they do now. It was Commissioner Zelli is what I call their environmental justice program. Now they have an extensive program and they are listening to community voices. And so I hope that you carry on that because as we get this IIJA funds, we have to make sure that we just don't railroad projects through that are hurting and harming communities and building barriers faster. We need to make sure that we're hearing the community's voice and that these improvements help not only our environment, but help our families and communities with economic prosperity. So please, please um, make sure we're making our state stronger and not, we're not hindering it or harming it. And then it has been the greatest honor of my life, Madam Chair, to serve as the higher education chair in the Minnesota House. You heard about my roots. My, my mom getting her education really changed the, changed the trajectory of our family. I didn't, I didn't tell you that my mom and dad retired when they were 56 and 57 years old. 
And when they traveled the country for 14 years, they never stayed anywhere more than two to 14 days, except one time they stayed somewhere for a month. And I'm so very, very proud of them. And I'm so happy to be able to bring the voices to the um, table and expand the power for higher education, listening to students' voices, listening to faculty and staff, and listening to people of color and indigenous uh, people, and finding out what their needs are. And that whole mental health um, area that we really try to focus on and um, creating access and affordability and wrapping around services. We have a new, well, hopefully we get past the bill that's been passed by the House and set, well, waiting for it by the Senate, that we have a new parent initiative to help our students get through inclusive, um, inclusive, uh, help me represent, inclusive higher ed bill to help make sure that 5,000 students across this state have access to higher education and are able to earn their credentials. There's so much that we can do and bipartisanly and I have been an honor to work with the chairs and be able to get our committee um, bills done on time and before special sessions and uh, most recently working with Senator David Tomasoni who um, I have such great respect for. And if you went to his party, who could possibly fill a room with more Democrats and Republicans at the very same time? And um, it was, it's been an honor to serve with him. So now as, I, and now as I part, I'm really excited about the next chapter in life. I don't know what is in store for me, but I do know one thing that we do plan to do is I, we, plan to try, we plan to make some trips to Europe and and, and later on in life, we want to travel Europe and travel our roots. The first time I left the legislature, I did extensive ancestry research. And um, I see here in this body all the, the beauty and the strength of communities, of first generation communities, and um, the Jewish community, and how people come together. They know their heritage. They celebrate it. And, um, we want that for our family too. My daughters have mentioned, you know, mom, why, why don't we have that like um, her, her uh, Romanian friends or um, East European friends or her Hmong friends or um, other friends she has. And you know, when I've done my research, when we came, o when I, my ancestors came over in the late 1800s, they, had to t they, they actually took classes to how to get rid of their heritage and to become like Americans. And so that is one of the things that um, we hope to do when, we, when, um, when I leave this place. But I want to personally thank um, the staff here, the front, de the clerk's office and um, the sergeant's office. You guys are amazing and I just wish the whole world and country was like you because you are like, I want to say Switzerland, but I know they're not totally neutral right now. <laughs> but you, you just like embrace us all and you treat us all kind, whether we're Democrats or Republican. And then all the people behind the scenes, from, from our maintenance to our, our cooks, to everybody who helps make this place work, I want to thank you. And then um, you all know our nonpartisan staff do, do amazing things for us, and, and they're up in that boat of amazing people. And then I want to thank... Um, our, our leadership in the House, uh, our, um, the members, and my team of people that have supported me as staff, and that's Sean, Gina, Bennett, Sam, Kevin, Addie, Eric, and Lindsay. These are amazing people, and they sacrifice so much for us to um, make us uh, do the best we possibly can. And I, I just want to mention, uh, I talked about our higher ed committee. We're, we're I, I think, often, if not the only all-women conference committee. And um, it's pretty amazing the work we do and the collaboration we do and how we are able to get our work done. And I also have had the opportunity to serve in, at one point in time, the only uh, Senate district that had three women representing those bodies. Now we're up to three, possibly four, those Senate districts. And so um, we, have a, we have a lot more to do and we have a lot more to give. And it's been an honor to serve with you. You all are amazing. You sacrifice so much. Your family sacrificed so much. You have your passion, your drive, and you know, let's, you know, we're the only undivided legislature in the country. Let's like make it work and, um, be a beacon of hope for um, 
for the world of how we can work together coming from different sides of the aisle. And keep up the Civility Caucus. That was something I was um, proud to collaborate with Joanne Ward on and um, be one of the first 26 in the country to be trained as the National Institute of uh, Civil Discourse as a next generation facilitator. We went to Iowa and spent two days with them with their whole legislature, not Iowa, Idaho, with their whole legislature and getting the Civility Caucus off the ground. I, that, there's a lot of potential there and just uh, get to know each other, build relationships, and get the job done for Minnesota and uh, make a difference in people's lives. Everybody, from, no matter where they live, how they pray, or what they look like, every Minnesotan matters, and we're going to be successful when we be sure that, that, they can that everyone can thrive and have opportunity in our state. So thank you very much. The member from Hennepin, Representative Davney. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, uh, Madam Speaker, the, the guidelines two minutes for every year of service, correct? <laughs> Let me first, uh, well, my service here and my dog have taught me to uh, be grateful. And so let me start with some thank yous. And then as I continue, I'll remember the folks that I forgot to thank and try to catch up at the end. Although I got most of them, I think. Uh, first to my family. My wife, Kara, my daughter, Rose, my son, Eamon. Kara did, in fact, know what she was getting into when we got married 24 years ago. We met on a political campaign. Uh, my kids, uh, 21 and 19, have only known me serving in this house. Last night, they came down uh, for one last family tradition of bringing dad dinner at the legislature in the closing days. We bumped into Bob Meyerson and Catherine Thompson from the DFL Media Service, and we got up to the uh, Golden Horses. I'm not sure I'm supposed to tell anybody that, uh, but, but we did. And it was one of those special moments that you get the privilege of because you have the privilege of serving in this body. Thank you, Bob. When, when the kids were little, we'd be driving by on 94, and they'd point at the dome, and they'd say, Daddy's work. That was great. That was special. Uh, it was different when they pointed at the basilica and said, Daddy's work. <laughs> I had to explain to him that was a little different. Uh, life would have been very different if that had been daddy's work. Uh, I'm sure that growing up with a parent in elective office was different for them than their friends. But, you know, it's the childhood they had. To the chamber staff, Kathy Carlson, Mary Lee Davis, Tim Johnson, Gail Romanowski, and, of course, Patrick Murphy, and all the staff behind them, Corey, Paul, Mom, you're up there somewhere, and many others who slip quietly in and out of this chamber. Thank you for your tireless hours processing the product of our work, the professional guidance and insights you share, not laughing at us as often as probably uh, justified, as well as your smiles and persistent personal warmth, and of course, the candy. <laughs> I suspect next May my blood sugar level will be lower than it has been the last 22 Mays. Just a hunch. To Bob and your staff and all those who serve us and protect us, thank you. To the caucus staff on our side of the aisle, to my LAs, Wilson, Andy, Brittany, I know you're watching. Spencer, Mars, Mary, Barb, many of the, the many others who've supported and served me over the years. I pity the people who've had to manage my calendar. To the caucus IT staff, to all those folks. It's been a point of pride that my office 
has consistently been the top in constituent contacts in our caucus. The combination of an engaged community and hardworking staff has meant that I've been able to be as connected to my community as possible, and my community is connected to our work here, as could be. Media staff, Gina, DJ, Kat, others, thank you for making me sound a whole lot better than I do on my own. To the caucus research staff and to the House nonpartisan staff, the revisor's office, all who patiently explained things to me, responded to requests, found ways to take an idea and actually make it work, sometimes threading some amazingly small needles to make that happen. I came here to do policy and politics. That's fun. It took some time, but I've increasingly come to appreciate the constituent service aspect of this job. It may be connecting people with health insurance or unemployment, rental assistance, late property tax refunds, or the DMV. It's a way we are privileged to touch lives most immediately when people bring their needs to us. To that con caucus constituent staff uh, who've served me and my community, thank you. You've solved problems, you've written responses, and guided me through the occasional complicated thicket. Now to, <clears throat> try that again. Now to the education team that I've had the privilege to work with for 22 years and lead the last four. Tim Strom, Christina Perra, Solve Beckel, Anna Mack, Annie Mack, Lisa Larson, for those of you who remember, Emily Adrians, and others on the nonpartisan side. On the partisan side, the amazing team of Sarah Burt, Mars Rudquist, Cindy Spreck, I'm grateful your, for your patience, for your wisdom, your insights, your professionalism, your warmth, your humor, your support. I can't imagine these last four years without all of you. To my, <clears throat> to my community of South Minneapolis, I'm awed and humbled by the trust and confidence you have placed in me the last 22 years. To come here every day knowing that my community has my back as I have tried to have yours, that their convictions are my convictions, and the faith that they've had that I will represent them here fully and with my best efforts has meant everything. We've all been through difficult times the last few years. I'm going to say that my community is one who's been through particularly difficult times. Those last weeks of May and June of 2020 were a time when every system that communities rely on had failed us, been damaged, or destroyed. Nothing in my training, in the conferences I've attended here, in the, my time here, prepared me to be in that moment with my community. My community stepped forward and self-organized. We met in parks, and I reached out, and I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do, but they looked for leadership. And after all, they had elected me to a position of leadership. And they handed me the bullhorn in that park. And for a guy who generally talks too much, as I'm demonstrating, <laughs> I didn't know what to say. But in that moment, it came to me. And I think it summed up all the years of service here. 
I looked at my community and simply said, I work for you. And from that flowed the work of those days and the years since. I love this state. That's why I first ran for office. It's in my bones. It's the way I was raised. And I hope in my time here, I've moved towards the goal of a Minnesota where everyone can thrive. I've had the privilege of focusing my work where my heart is on the children and families of this state. And I hope that I've left it a little better and that their lives have been enhanced by the work I've been able to do. Minnesotans are amazing people. And we're not the state we were 50 or 75 years ago where the key diversity was Norwegians or Swedes or Germans. We're better off for this. And most importantly, perhaps we're better off as a state as this body becomes more like the Minnesota of today. I'm told that Minnesota means where the waters reflect the sky in Dakota. It's good that the Minnesota House is increasingly better reflecting the people of Minnesota. One of the things that I've treasured about this work it is, is the opportunity it's provided me to gain insight into other communities, communities that are not my own, communities that I've, are not my background. I think particularly of a few opportunities that uh, this guy who's very in touch with his inner Norwegian has had the opportunity to learn and see. I think of the community Iftar, the Chair Noor organized in his Cedar Riverside community. Or the time that Chair Becker Finn took us wild ricing up on the Leech Lake Nation. I, she did organize it on take your child ricing day, so I was never quite sure what that meant. <laughs> but I'd been taught not to stand up in a canoe, and they had me stand up in a canoe. Uh, if you ever need the best wild rice in the world, connect with uh, Representative Becker Finn. And the graciousness that Chair Lee and his extended family showed us, allowing us to attend his father's funeral and experience faith traditions and practices that were their tradition. It's good to expand our worlds as leaders in our increasingly diverse communities. May we learn from each other, respect the inherent dignity and worth of every Minnesotan, and lead with all of them in mind. To my colleagues, both sides of the aisle, thank you. I've learned so much. I've spent a fair amount of time in my community interpreting Republican to my constituents. I've sometimes had to do it a couple of times, and sometimes it just hasn't worked, uh, hasn't stuck. Like all of us, I'm housebroken. I like the immediacy of this people's house. Our efforts to respond quickly to our constituents and current events, the bit of rough and tumble, and the camaraderie. To my Minneapolis delegation peeps, our community has shown these past few years that we are resilient and strong. And as a delegation, I'm glad that that time has drawn us closer and more cohesive. I'm going to miss that. A special thank you to my delegation friends. Members, each year I've had a practice of taking a little time, usually with a cup of coffee, sitting in the alcove and taking in this amazing place 
the debate going on at the time, the murmur from the gallery and the folks out front, and just being grateful for the privilege of being able to walk in those big doors, serve my community, and serve this state. I commend that practice to all of you. Members, Madam Speaker, thank you. The member from Cottonwood, Representative Hamilton. Uh, Madam Speaker, with your permission, I'd like to stay seated if I could please. Friends, I wasn't going to speak today uh, because if you know me, I wear my emotions on my sleeve, right? Gail, I stole your Kleenexes. I've been sitting here trying to gather my thoughts on what I'm going to say and it hasn't been going real well, so bear with me, all right? I look around asking myself, how did I get here? How did I get here? I think back, I was a punk kid, and when I graduated high school, I'd like to tell you it was with honors, but I'd be lying, right? I had an aunt and uncle that came to my graduation party that was held at my cousin's, and they said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to California. Life's a beach. I'm going to California. They said, what are you going to do there? I said, I don't know. I'll figure it out. They said, no, you're not. We're going to move you to Minnesota. We're going to throw you on a farm. We're going to work you and work you hard until you figure things out. I was so relieved. <laughs> a friend of mine called and said, Rod, do you like raising pigs? I grew up in town. And even though all the interviews that I've done, somehow they mistranslate it and say, I grew up on a farm. I did not. I grew up in town. When I was working on my uncle's farm, the friend calls up, says, do you like raising pigs? I said, Jeff, I don't know anything else. Just find me a job. My uncle's going to work me to death. <laughs> I went in for the job interview. They didn't hire me. It was because of my earring and my mullet. I swear, that's what it was. <laughs> But the owner of the company said, you know, I know that Hamilton kid, and he's not a bad kid. He just needs a chance. Just give him a chance. That's how I got my start in agriculture. Then in 1992, a couple brothers purchased the farm that I was working on. And they were young. Um, the owner was in his 30s, and he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And he wanted me to get involved externally. So I got involved in the pork producers and Farm Bureau. And that's how I really started getting involved in politics. And at roughly that same time, we started growing our family. And we also hired an HR director. This is a true story, and we did self-assessments. And I wrote on my self-assessment that I wanted to be as educated as I could possibly be. And I misspelled educated. <laughs> I kid you not. And when it was pointed out to me, I was extremely embarrassed. And I took it upon, my time, or took it upon myself right then and there to become as educated as I possibly could be. And I read, and I read, I read the bills, I make sure that I am prepared for the debates that we have here on the House floor, right? I've always been trying to prove to myself, um, you know, whether or not I was worthy. And, and uh, it's taken a long time to recognize that. You know, when I was uh, diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, I fell into deep depression. I was about 20, 25, 26 years old. Lene and I, we just purchased our first house for $28,000. We didn't have a lot of money. We couldn't afford enough furniture to fill the house. And my son, who was three years old at the time, 
It didn't bother he or I because we turned the living room into our football field. And we played football for hours. And he would score a touchdown, spike the ball, jump on my chest, and, you know, taunt me in your face, Daddy, right? Well, there was a time I was bad, suffering a bout with MS, and I was tired and, and hurting. And he runs in for a touchdown, and I fall on my back, and I'm just like, ugh. He jumps on my chest, takes his little hands and grabs my cheeks, and he says, never give up, Daddy. Never give up. <laughs> Friends, we have taken that, never give up, and I turned it into a simple 542. There's five letters in never, four letters in two, two letters in up. So if you see my Twitter account, it's rhamilton542. My email account is rhamilton542. It's a constant reminder to never give up, right? Because of my upbringing, I believe that I've had a little bit of chip on my shoulder. The first time I went out to Washington, D.C. with Farm Bureau to lobby on behalf of agriculture, I go into a congressional office. Our congressman wasn't there to meet with us, so we met with a staff member. We're going around doing our little spiel, right? And the staff person that was listening to us was saying, yep, 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 next, yep, 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 next, completely blowing us off, and I was getting madder and madder and madder. It gets to me, and I do my spiel, and he says, yep, next, and I said, wait a minute. I said, I traveled thousands of miles to be heard, right? I expect to be heard. This is important to us. He says, you are heard, next. I said, wait a minute. If I was heard, what would I say? And he goes, well, you said, and his eyes started watering, his lips started quivering, he had no clue. He said, all of you, out of my office. And I'm thinking, it's not your office, it's the people's office. If you think I was disrespectful, I will leave. But you better listen to the others. I walk out in the hallway and thought, oh my goodness, what did I do? I share that with you because when individuals came to meet me after I was elected, I treated everybody with respect and dignity, even when we disagreed. It's not my office, it's the office that I occupy. It's not my district, it's the district that I serve. And so even when we disagreed, I made sure we treated everybody with respect and dignity. And the staff that I've worked with are phenomenal. They've heard that story and they too treated everybody with respect and with dignity. <laughs> when Governor Pawlenty invited us as, uh, uh, as legislators to the governor's mansion, it was a cross section of legislators, right? And it was House and, and Senate. Um, it was Democrats, Republicans, young and old, if you will, seasoned and, and new. I was there and again, showed a little bit of, uh, um, we go around, we're making introductions. It gets to me, I'm Rod Hamilton. I'm a pork producer from Mountain Lake. There's an old seasoned Senator standing right next to me. And he looked me up and down and he says, oh, a pig farmer, huh? Must be a lot different working up here than what you're used to. And I fired back without hesitation. I said, no, not really, just two legs versus four. <laughs> so as soon as I said it, as soon as I said it, I thought, oh, no, there I go again, my mouth getting me in trouble. And thankfully, um, our colleague, Steve Simon, was right across. He was a freshman with me as well. And to break the ice, he started laughing. He said, I don't know why Hamilton was looking at me, the only Jewish person in the room, you know, when he was talking about pork production. <laughs> Everybody laughed, and Steve saved me from myself. And, and again, so I've had, I've had uh, those moments when uh, my mouth got ahead of me. And I just want everybody to know that if I was disrespectful, uh, a sincere apology, sincere apology. And I, I hope and I pray that I've treated everybody with respect and with dignity. You know, relationships around here are so important. You think about it, since we were elected, Madam Speaker and Leon and, excuse me, Representative Lilly and others, we've been in the majority, minority, the majority, the minority, majority, and back in the minority. In six terms, or excuse me, in nine terms, we changed six times. So think about that. And because of those relationships that we've built, 
Um, I've been able to get things accomplished when I was in the minority, like when I was in the majority. It's absolutely imperative that we reach across the party lines. You know what? Look around us. Every single one of us, we're good people, beautiful, beautiful people, simply standing up for what we believe in. And when we get those fights going on and, and stuff like that, it does break my heart because, again, you're good people, right? I've had members here in the metro area invite me out to their area to go out for dinner and stuff. Please do that. Take them up on it. Come out to the rural areas and meet with us because I know if the people that I represent would meet you, they too would know that you're a good person. And so it absolutely breaks my heart in the event uh, we don't see it that way. You know, all too often we fear what we don't take the time to understand. Whether it's the color of our skin, the languages we speak, the way we dress, the way we choose to worship, the positions we hold, if we would simply take the time to get to know one another, we will find beauty all around us. And that's so true. You know, this has been the honor of a lifetime. And I know that's on somebody's bingo sheet, but I'm going to say it again. <laughs> this has been the honor of a lifetime. And I know when I look at the veterans in the room, I know it's because of you that a punk kid like me has the opportunity to serve in the Minnesota House of Representatives. Thank you. When it comes to giving thank yous to all the beautiful people that I've worked with, from building services to the chief clerk's office, to lobbyists, to my constituents, to staff, I started making a list. And if I would in individually go through it, we would be here forever. So I'm simply going to say this. If you do not know, or if I didn't make it clear, how much you meant to me. I simply say I'm sorry because I failed us both. Because you've been remarkable, the help that you've given me. So I'm going to say it this way. I love you all so much that I want to say that again. I love you all. Thank you. God bless. Member from Mille Lacs, Representative Erickson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, welcome to uh, our last official day here. You know, it's really a blessing to be able to serve in a place like this, and I never expected to do it. Uh, I was born in Minnesota, grew up in North Dakota, uh, didn't think about politics until I was nine years of age, 1951, when uh, the late Senator Robert Taft decided that he wanted to seek the nomination for the uh, presidency. Uh, as you know, Ike in the end won. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower became our president. But he traveled to every Taft in the nation, and I happened to live with my family, my siblings and my mom and dad, at Taft, North Dakota. So in September of 1951, he came with his entourage 
We were building a new cupola for the grain elevators that my father managed for the farmers. And uh, he even drove in a nice big spike. Uh, but before that, my dad had to explain to me who this person was and what his politics were. And that's when I discovered that in our family, Republican principles were pretty steep and pretty rooted. But what an exciting experience to think back on that and know that um, little Taft, North Dakota, with just our family, uh, we grew eventually to be eight. My mother was pregnant with number six at the time. But um, our little family living in a, at a siding called Taft, North Dakota, uh, and called a siding because the grain elevators were there for the, of course, trains to stop and pick up the grain. Uh, and I tell you, I spent uh, all my years from nine years of age until I graduated high school working with my dad in the elevators because my brothers, older and younger, were asthmatic. So I did a lot of shoveling. I went uh, up on a pull elevator to uh, grain bins that were high up in the uh, cupola and check to see if there was mold because maybe the barley was wet and I didn't check it when the farmer brought it in because that was one of my jobs to make sure that I did the moisture count when uh, I took a sample from the, the uh, truck that was hauling this into uh, Taft Farmer's Elevator. So that was a huge responsibility and my dad always held me to that. Um, but you know, we had to have some fun too and my brothers, even though those two brothers, even though asthmatic, we put up a basketball hoop and we would shoot in the driveway of the elevator. It was a really nice large driveway. And so uh, that's when I got into sports, even though we didn't have sports in North Dakota. But I had to play with my brothers. I had to take those hard pitches when they fired in that ball to, my, to the glove that I was wearing that was, you know, really, really thin. Uh, but, you know, I made it, and uh, today I love to play ball with my grandson, Cash. And uh, speaking of that, I want to thank my family, uh, Carter, Rachel, and Cash, uh, who moved here from California uh, about uh, six, seven years ago. And uh, my son, being a lawyer, began to study Minnesota law, and he was really an enlightenment for me to understand <laughs> some of the complications that we bring about in our legislation that hurt small business, because he and Rachel have a small business. Uh, also the family and uh, schools as well, because uh, Cash went to Little Nevis, which is a small district near Park Rapids. So uh, I learned a lot from them, and I know if my late husband were living, uh, he would have enjoyed this as well because he was a staunch conservative, and I loved it while well, he lived, but he's been gone many years. So this is my 23rd year, and I like to think about where I've sat on this House floor. I started in, after my special election sitting back by uh, Ms. Representative Quam. Then the next session, I was moved to Pat Garofalo's seat in the dog pound, and I started earning bones, and I loved it. <laughs> I was doing something that was considered conservative in the eyes of my colleagues, and that was so great. And then I moved to uh, where Representative Damoth sits, and that was right behind Majority Leader Tim Pawlenty, to whom I would send little notes about some of his misspellings when he was preparing documents. <laughs> he had a really hard time distinguishing between pos you know, possessives and contractions. And I just had a great time. Carol Molnow would sit there and grimace at me, but I would send Tim Palenti these notes and say, you know, before you send that out, make this little correction. Or it might have been some other word, but he, he was a, a, a great majority leader behind uh, for me to sit behind and learn. And then I moved to Tamatice's place, uh, the next session, and then finally to Representative Albright, uh, where I sat then in the row, now behind Tom Emmer, who was the minority leader. And Tom had a habit of really not doing his research as well as I thought he should. And so I'm busy on the computer sending him facts and information because he was, as, as you know, quite vociferous. Uh, in his presentations, and it was so much fun then to be able to send that to him and Marty Seifert, of course, sat next to him. And uh, we, we just really had a growth time. And uh, then I lost in 2008. So when I returned in 2011, 
I was placed here, which I told Mary Liz Holberg I really wanted to sit in this place because I really wanted to be in the, the center loop. And so I've sat here, and I've been so blessed to have Carolyn McFacklerick, uh, who came from the north, and then she was followed by Andrea Kiefer, who came from the eastern suburbs, and then uh, that was followed by Drew Christensen, who at the time was the youngest elected member of our caucus, and maybe in the legislature as well. And then today I sit by the amazing Kristen Robbins, and we have such a, a great relationship and, and so much fun to go through. Uh, I served under five governors, four of whom I've worked very well with. I'm hoping to work with the present one, uh, and I won't be an elected official, but I hope to, to work with Governor Walls. And uh, I've had seven speakers, and uh, I've served on every committee except uh, natural resources, jobs, and um, what's the other one? Public safety and judiciary. I, and I would sign up for those, but for some reason, I didn't get uh, those positions. But anyway, education, as you know, has been my, uh, my mainstay, and I have loved it. Uh, but a highlight during all these years that I've served, these 23 years, has really been our Bible study that we've had every week. And Representative Sands did join us and uh, others, uh, many of who are in this room. Uh, but we started way, way back in uh, the, the uh, 2000s uh, when we came into the majority and continued on. And now it's a Zoom, uh, which I have not had a lot of time to participate in. But it was just such an enrichment in my life uh, because it was giving me an understanding of what the Lord wanted me to do. What did he have in mind for me? Because I have a saying that the Lord opens a door and closes a door, or closes a door and opens another door. So I'm excited to see what I do in the future. And that reminds me of 1 Corinthians, where St. Paul writes, after meeting new friends, which all of you are in this room at some point, they refreshed my spirit. And what a great quote to have in Scripture because you're recognizing the uh, individualness, the differences in all of our members. And then remembering the power of Scripture when debate heats up, and Representative Daphne and Representative Richardson know all about that because I can get pretty heavy, hot and heavy. But then I have to think about Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God that you may stand with truth and perseverance. So as I continue in this uh, goodbye speech, I want to extend my gratitude to uh, Jody Withers. Uh, most of you know that he is very schooled in the law, and I would guess public safety as well as education, but he's been the best teacher for me and for any one of you who might want to learn exactly what's in the statutes. And we together have reviewed the chapters of education, and I've learned so much because I've learned to be a deep reader, and that's important to me and I hope to all of you. And then to Christina Perra and Tim Strom, who've already been mentioned, and to Lisa Larson, who worked for us uh, in many years as well. And the front desk, of course, to Chief Clerk Patrick Murphy, and to Gail Robinowski, with whom I've had the closest relationship. And then I think of my days with Ed Burdick in front of us. And those of you who didn't get to serve in this place when Ed Burdick was the Chief Clerk have, have missed something because he was a statesman. I don't think he ever sat, and no offense to you, uh, uh, <laughs> Chief, Chief Clerk Murphy, but I don't think Ed ever sat down. He was always standing, and of course, he knew the rules so well, and that was so good for us to know. Uh, and then to my committee administrators and fellow GOP education chairs like Pat Garofalo, Rod Kresha, uh, former Representative Jennifer Loon, and I must confess to my colleagues over here on the other side of aisle have taught me a lot. Representative Daphne, Representative Richardson, Representative Marquardt, Representative Yoakui Kim. I've learned so much from them. Didn't always agree with them, but I certainly did learn, and I learned, you know, that I need to think probably outside the box. And then to my former committee administrators, Carmen, Andrew, Casey, I had at least a dozen LAs over my years because I was kind of the um, trading uh, station. So I'd get them all trained, uh, and then they'd go on to somebody else or become a lobbyist or become a CA, uh, like uh, uh, Casey did, as well as a Carbon. 
and of course to Bob Meyerson, who was just what we needed during the pandemic. Because I came to the office almost every day and to know that he was there keeping us safe was just a phenomenal piece of security that I appreciated. Uh, and you know, knowing that uh, if I stayed in my office, I was safe. But if I left it and I had my mask, I should appro appropriately wear it. Uh, but, but his understanding was so good. And then, of course, I've served on the uh, Legislative Audit Commission for many, many years. And so I want to thank Judy Randall and her staff, and before her, Jim Nobles. They have been great uh, leaders in the area of audit that we really need to continue to focus on uh, auditing. In the reference library, uh, Elizabeth Lincoln was always my go-to. And of course, I can't forget my former student, Kurt Dout. You know, he was on the student council all four years of high school. And then he just kind of, uh, you know, grew and grew and grew township, county, state. So I'm so proud of him that he, uh, now serving as a minority leader, but he was a great speaker, I thought. Uh, of course, I'm opinionated, but he was a good speaker and a great one, and I hope that he can return to that position someday. So in closing, I want to leave you with the principles that have grounded me. And I've used an acronym. Some of you know what it is. It's LIFE, L-I-F-E, to represent the principles that have guided me through my legislative career and my life. Uh, L is for limited government. Wouldn't you know? That should always be our goal, to, to, uh, to stay away from mandating or regulating everything that comes our way. Uh, pass only that legislation that is needed, not that which is wanted. I is for individual freedom and individual responsibility. You know, God created each of us in his image with a purpose for each of us. So we need to honor that, and we need to honor that around us as we look at our colleagues and remember that they, too, have been created uh, in the image of our Lord. F is for fiscal restraint and fiscal responsibility. Spending beyond our means has to stop, from my perspective. Like families, we need to live within our means now and for the future. And E, of course, is for excellence in education. High expectations by teachers and parents the imparting of core knowledge, you know, that liberal arts education which we want our students to have as they matriculate to college, ensuring that all students can read proficiently, compute math problems, and understand God's creation, and last but not least, our great American heritage. Good, bad, and ugly, we want them to understand that. And of course, life to me also means the protection of, of everyone from conception to natural birth, and I hope that that will always be a guiding principle. So God bless you, God bless our great state, and God bless our great nation, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to work with you, because I could tell you all something special that I know about you on both sides of the aisle. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker and members. The member from Clay, the best tax chair in the United States of America, <laughs> Representative Paul Marquardt. Thank you, Madam Chair, <laughs> Madam Speaker, and members. I first of all want to start out by saying what an honor and privilege it has been to serve 22 years in this Minnesota House of Representatives. It's been such an honor, and you, you learn things quickly. Uh, I remember my very first day, we'd been sworn in one day, and the very next day, I get my calendar. And you remember, you used to get your calendar on a piece of paper. And it said, three, my first appointment was in 311 SOB. 
And so uh, at five to nine, I take off for my meeting, and I forget who it was with. And I go all around the third floor, and I get back to my L.A. Jerry Boyce. I said, Jerry, I can't find a 311 SOB. She said, Representative Marquardt, right there, it's your office. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I, so the first thing I learned was where my office was. And another thing that I learned early on, my very first committee meeting was education policy with Chairman Harry Maris, a Republican. And I got there about 10 minutes early, as I thought you were supposed to be. And I was there, but there's one other person there, Chair Maris. And I must have impressed him because it was about the third meeting in, and here I am a freshman, he's got a bill up, uh, would Representative Marquardt please take the gavel? <laughs> My word. But what it showed me is what bipartisanship is supposed to look like. And that was really a key that day. Uh, you never do things alone. And so I just want to go through some thank yous for my legislative assistants, Jerry Boyce, Paul Cummings, Peter Strohmeyer, Joe Gold, and my current legislative uh, assistant for the last 10 years, Ursula Griska. We all know you don't go very far without those people keeping you uh, in line. Uh, it was also an honor to chair committees. And we all know that the committees operate because of your committee administrators. And I had some wonderful ones, Sarah Carlson Walrath, uh, Shannon Patrick, Nathan Jessen, and my current committee administrator, Polly Sergvanik. Um, thank you for helping make a difference in people's lives. Uh, people have mentioned the nonpartisan staff, I mean in the House. We're so fortunate to have people that support us, they work for us, they make us look good, and it's, you know, house research, partisan, nonpartisan, uh, media, constituency, the front desk, the sergeant at arms, uh, they do such a wonderful job uh, representing the state of Minnesota. Uh, can we get this done once and for all? The tax committee is the best committee in the house. <laughs> Chief Clerk, Chief Clerk Murphy, please note that in the journal uh, for me. To, but I really want to thank uh, all the tax committee members uh, for all of your work and um, it was a true honor to represent you. I learned some really good things under former tax chairs. Uh, my first one was uh, Chair Abrams, Chair Crinky, Chair Davids, who we go back about 30 years. Thank you so much. Uh, chair Lincheski, who when I was the property tax chair, took me under her wing and taught me a lot of good things about tax policy. And so, uh, thank you very much. I want to thank the speakers of the House who had the faith and confidence in me to name me to a committee chair to help make a difference. Margaret Anderson Kelleher, Paul Thiessen, and Speaker Melissa Hortman. And Speaker Hortman, the last two years, we have gone through the worst pandemic in 100 years and a killing that shocked the world. And you kept this institution strong and stable. And you did that with compassion, with strength, and with dignity. And this body and this institution remained intact and strong because of your leadership. Thank you so much. I want to thank my constituents. I represent the best district in the state for 22 years. And I always enjoyed door knocking. That was always I don't know if funnest is a world, but it's always the most fun thing I did as a legislator, and it kept me grounded on who I represented. And I will tell you, I especially like those constituents 
who would vote for the Republican at the top of the ticket and then me for legislature. And I really enjoyed them because they're the ones that made the minority leader go crazy. <laughs> I want to thank my students at Dilworth Glendon Felton who kept me optimistic uh, for the future. Uh, I'll be teaching my 40th year, one more year, and I've thoroughly uh, enjoyed that. Uh, thank you to my senators, Senator Keith Langseth and Senator Ken Eakin, who I served with and formed a really, really good, good team. And thank you to all of you. I have enjoyed each and every day, and I'm not going to name names, uh, but I always enjoyed the famous Pulowski gatherings, those of you who know about that. I appreciate members that always had my back. I enjoyed the wrestling stories, talking family, talking taxes, of course. <laughs> uh, and uh, as I think about that, I, I think about uh, all that you've given me, and I really, really appreciate that. And I have to say, my proudest legislative accomplishment was successfully passing the largest tax cut in the hit. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I, 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 I forgot to take that out. <laughs> so. <laughs> Finally, uh, and most important, I want to thank my family. So as others have said, um, you know, first of all, I learned kind of the value of public service uh, from my parents, who were actually married in 1935 uh, during the Great Depression. And they talked a lot about President Roosevelt, and they talked about how government can do good and help people. And, and that's, we talk, they would talk about that around the family table. Um, Thank you to my siblings who helped drive me in parades and, and put up signs and so forth. And a huge thank you to my wife, Clean, who didn't sign up for this, and my family, uh, for their love and support, because it just would not be possible without that. And um, every time I would run, the old saying is, you need 50% plus one to win an election, I'd always start with my wife clean and get that vote. <laughs> and I thank my, my daughters, Lindsay and Ashley, both teachers, which I'm very proud of, married to Grant and Drew, and then the three grandchildren they've given us, and probably why I'm standing here right now, Addison, Lincoln, and Hadlin. I, I love you so much, and my Daughter Ashley reminded me that when I first was elected, um, she was going into the fourth grade, and now she just is completing her eighth year as a teacher. So how time flies. So um, thank you to my family. Uh, finally, one last thing. This institution and all of you have given me a lot more than I've ever given back. But I'm going to ask all of you members one thing, if you would do this for me. Please take care of little Johnny. Please take care of little Johnny. Madam Speaker, it's been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. The member from Ramsey, Representative Mariani. Thank you, Madam Speaker. First, before I say anything, I want to say this. 
I live on Ojibwa and Lakota land. I thank my indigenous brothers and sisters for hosting my life on their homeland. Members, um, it's kind of hard to believe that this moment is here. Um, it's been 32 years. Um, still wrapping my, uh, my mind around that. Uh, my grandkids are almost old enough to vote for me now. <laughs> Chair Davids, uh, it's on you, man. You're the last of our class. Carry it well. Yes, it is, it has been a privilege, a deep privilege of a lifetime. Yes. And with that, let me just quickly cite James Baldwin, a treasure, a great American, a great humanist, a teacher for us all. He wrote, Everything now, we must assume, is in our hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. Yes, a privilege. Jim, I love the wisdom you shared about taking that time, sitting and just being, you're here, but you're also somewhere else. Because I've done that as well. I've sat in the front, in the pages bench, in the midst of fierce debates here, and just pulled myself out of that debate for a few seconds to watch you, to watch us, and to glory in it as we assume that moment that James Baldwin tells us we need to be in. I've also done it from the back and from the gallery and different places. And I've also done it, as Representative Mary Murphy knows, from sitting in the back and just tilting my head back and just, wow. Seeing the names, Duluth, Hennepin, LaSalle, Perot, and accepting that and embracing that and knowing that there are other names Hassan's, Taos, Rodriguez. They're not there etched, but they're there because we are here. This is an incredible convergence here. And it was meant to be that. And it's up to us to make that. As many of my colleagues um, did um, earlier, I'm going to get to doing some thanks right away because otherwise I will forget. And um, what I won't do, um, and um, what, what I won't do is just go through the list that has been so wonderfully um, described. Uh, with so much love and genuine appreciation by so many others um, this evening, or this morning, it feels like evening, I guess. Um, yes, Representative Hamilton, uh, that is about love. That is about respect. And so to all here, all our staff, all the people that make this institution the living, breathing manifestation of the best of who and what we are, thank you. I do want to name specifically 
a few people, and I'll start with my wife, Maritza. She would be here if she could, uh, but she's at work. And she's an incredibly remarkable human being and, and woman. Through her efforts over many years, literally hundreds and hundreds of families, especially immigrant families, have been able to become homeowners. And she was able to do that work while tolerating the work I do uh, by supporting the work I do, by literally and figuratively holding me just as your loved ones, each and every one of you, hold you, especially when we get beat up because there's just no way, there's no way to be a legislator without getting beat up. We actually embrace it because that is life. You struggle with the knot and that act of struggling is the creative moment. That's what we do here. Democrats, Republicans, conservative, liberals, progressives. And so we need, I need Maritza to hold me because I'm hurting. And then I come back, you come back the next day and you struggle with that knot again. That's the essence of our governance. It's the wisdom of who we are as a people. And we're willing, we embrace paying that price. Because as Rod shared, because there's love. Thank you, Maritza, gracias. I wanna thank my daughter, Caritza, wonderful woman who spent six years working at an HBCU in Texas, creating opportunities for black and brown young people. Phenomenal human being. She grew up in this place. She used to do her homework at, at, at a desk next, next to my desk on the floor of the house. My son, Carlos Luis, who manages people at that new thing we created here, brew pubs. And, he, and by the way, Zach, thank you for that bill, man. <laughs> And, and because it's how you do things in life, it's him managing people so that they can be good and fulfilled. And part of that comes from him being here. None of you remember this, because it's pretty far back, but you know that, that little kid used to tear through this place and drive people like Bob Myers and absolutely nuts. Who are those kids? <laughs> My other son uh, had on our youngest. Uh, yes, he was kidnapped by Mary Murphy. Um, we had him um, in my fourth year here, brought him to the um, chamber and uh, Mary absconded with him and just laid a ton of love on that little baby. And you know, Mary, He's a good, loving man in public service, doing wonderful work. Thank you for your little bit, but important bit of just establishing that warmth and that love. That's also what we do here. This is not just a transactional mechanical thing we do. This is a human thing that we do. Please don't ever lose that. My grandkids, um, Jim, they used to bring me food too, you know. And we'd sit up on the bench, you know, Paige's bench and take pictures and goof around and um, point out different folks. I mean, family, and I wasn't the only one, so many of us. 
embrace this convergence place as a family place. That's right. So thank you to my, my grandkids. I want to thank as well someone who needs no introduction, Mr. Jamal Lundy. What a pain in the butt. <laughs> You know, I told him this last night that um, the meaningfulness of what we do here brings people together. And with him and me, it's, I get a phone call at home, my wife sees the call and the name pops up and she turns to me and says, your son's calling. There is power and life affirming this in what we do here, if we allow it. Thank you, Jamel. I want to thank the people of 65B, a great district, a wonderful district. And by the way, I never have to leave my district to go to work because we're in my district. It has the mighty Mississippi carving right through it. it. Has bluffs. It has our our capital city, and it has always been, as far as I as long as I've represented it, a multiracial, multicultural, multiethnic, multilinguistic place. Always. It's been a blessing to reflect these people, these neighbors, and an incredible advantage because I know how their hearts beat and you know how my heart beats. Our alignment with our people, wherever they are, it's so critically important for us to do this well. Always do that. I want to thank the Latino people, La Raza, in Minnesota. You supported me. You expected much of me. You beat me up quite a bit. And we did and will continue to do good work. I think we'll have a Latina from my district here. Please welcome her with open arms as you continue to welcome that community into our broad community of families. Madam Speaker, I want to thank you. And I can't do it as eloquently as my friend Paul just did. That was wonderful and so true. And given what he identified, the, the context within which you have put yourself forward, I can tell you this, I am so glad I'm not the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> you are remarkable. And you believe in me, and I believe in you. Thank you. What I really want to say um, could be done pretty sh in a short manner, but you know that ain't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to say in my last speech on this floor of this special institution is simply this. Love this often rugged place. Treat it with respect. It is all that stands between us as a people and lack of hope. It provides a process, a way for a large and diverse people to have order, peace, safety, use of the bounties of this land to help realize the dreams of everyone. All of us come here as a result of a journey. We are each the fruit of a long journey the journey of our elders, P. 
people who wished you. We are the product of their dreams. They gifted us tools like this institution as an act of love and belief in us to use so that we could dream, so we could carry a dream, so we could keep the journey and honor them and ourselves by having a way to problem solve the difficulty, inevitable difficulty of living together and so that we could also celebrate one another. It's an incredible gift that's been given us. Each of us are on a journey and our paths are meant to have met here. Here in this place of sky and water, here in the Minnesota House of Representatives, my journey involves two immigrants who grew up in poverty and traveled to this nation to work and by working to survive in fields, hand-picking crops, on foundry floors making steel, in inner city school lunchrooms feeding children. A four-year-old boy sits on a barber's chair as his father and other men speaking in Spanish share information on where to get a job. It's hard, man. Los Americanos, they won't hire you if you speak Spanish. They treat you bad. See, but we have to work, whatever it is. They stoically accept their fate to do what has to be done. The child speaks up with a voice that for the first time comes from deep within. Un día todo cambiará por nosotros. One day, all these things will change for us. The men are stunned, fall silent, amazed, and finally one says, si, es cierto, yes, that's true. The boy is 11, news arrives that Dr. King is murdered. The world explodes. The family barricades itself in its second floor apartment as grief and anger consumes their inner city neighborhood as it is literally burned down. Fires everywhere, gunshots, screams for several days in a row. When the National Guard finally takes over with bayonets and jeeps patrolling his street, the boy emerges, looks at the smoke and rubble and thinks, Something big has happened here, bigger than individuals getting mad. I need to understand it because I never want to see that again. That's my story. I know it's your story as well in your experiences. The boy is a teen, he walks those streets and one night he is hit on the head with a blood object. As he rises from the fall, he stares at a gun pointed in his face. Your wallet. As the teen hands the wallet over, the man laughs and with the gun held inches from his face, pulls the trigger. Click. Pulls again. Click. The man runs off. It's cold outside. The boy is a young man. He covers the lady, Nuestra Senora, with a blanket. She only is brought out once a year on her feast day and then only to encircle her home. But this evening, we bring her out and gently put her in a cart that we pulled three miles over the Mississippi River, singing all the way. We are meeting Minnesotans from all over the state at the cathedral to end the hunger strike of several Latinos and their allies. Salvadoran priests, their gardener, maids have been slaughtered by armed men <coughs> in uniforms as their nation was ruled by a military government that our nation trained and supported. 
The hunger strikers had chained themselves to the cathedral altar and were passing in and out of consciousness as they demanded our government to stop the murdering. In a remarkable moment, Minnesota Democrat and Republican elected officials brokered by the Archbishop were coming together as one voice to compel our national government to act. This was to be a night of solidarity then, clear moral purpose and political focus to affirm our collective power as a people to do justice. As we entered the cathedral, the word had gotten around. The Guadalupanos are coming and they are singing. A space in front of the congregation was made for us as we wheeled in the dark-skinned, brown-eyed, dark-haired senora. We listened as U.S. senators, congresspeople, mayors, state legislators, party officials, one by one, stood before the massive congregation and committed to one another to end the evil. I walked back home alone to answer for myself the question of running for the newly opened Minnesota House seat. By the time I arrived at home, I was a candidate. All these things add up, you know that. It's all added up in your lives. A white woman comes to my home porch after losing her babies, and a bill to prevent that from happening to others was born. Undocumented youth came to my office, and with House legal staff, legislation was shaped to create post-secondary access for them. Undocumented kids empowered with access to legal professional staff here in this institution to shape laws that impact their lives. I didn't come up with that. They did. The first ever legislative hearing conducted in a state prison. We did that. We sat with felons some doing life. And there was a signal of hope and connection. They'll pay what they need to pay. And yet together we can affirm humanity. George was murdered and the world exploded. I sat on my front porch that evening as I heard the news and watched the horrible video of his killing at the hands of people that I, as a state official, licensed and sanctioned to protect citizens. I picked up my phone and called Jamal, and within an hour, House legal staff and us were crafting legislation that three months later became law because it had to, because it is what holds us together, because our elders dreamed us to do so, because, in this case, ending racism and harm and doing justice is central to our journey, all of us, our journey, as we correct the errors that they also bequeathed us. We are best when we are the journey that brought us to here. Madam Speaker, with your permission, I would like to approach the well. You may.
I also did it as well. It's the first time as a state rep. I read it, walked out, probably were really innocent, and I was late because you know me. <laughs> <laughs> Any other announcements? Any further announcements? The member from Hennepin, Representative Winkler. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I really uh, hate the end of the legislative session for one particular reason, because you get tired and your uh, emotional reserves go and you start getting emotional in public, which is like my least favorite thing. <laughs> um, 
there's a reason my children call me Stoneheart. <laughs> and it is because I think that we have to bring our very best to the work that we do and to our lives. We need to be driven by our passion, <clears throat> our passions and our feelings, but we need to have the discipline, the control, the thoughtfulness to channel that into being our very best selves. And I don't like it <laughs> when my reserves run low. So I just want to uh, say, first of all, I've already given a retirement speech. I don't intend to uh, share with you my journey, to the, how I got here, or uh, what those particular feelings are. What I'd like to do instead is talk a little bit about the last four years and how we leave this institution. When I was first elected majority leader, uh, I had a dinner on behalf of Joyce Pepin, who was the outgoing majority leader. We invited every single person alive who had ever served in this role, and none of them had served more than four years. Uh, so I figured out pretty early on that I had a shelf life in this job, and the more that I did it, I realized why. <laughs> I'll get to that in a bit. I want to first say that this is a very strange place. People bring all this emotion. There's this sense of drama at the end of session, this feeling that what we do is so consequential, that human lives are in our hands. And when our family and friends come here, what they most often say is, that's really boring. <laughs> what a dull place. You know how disappointing it is to pour your heart and soul into something and have people, kids in the gallery up here watch it and they're like, are we done? Can we get out of here? Like, we have one fan, and he's right up there right now. <laughs> uh, but it is a peculiar place. It's a peculiar group of people who are attracted to it. Uh, we now make, on average, you know, $45,000 a year for a salary. We work for months and months on end to get elected. We raise, we do, like, things that normal people would never do. We call up family and friends and ask for money. Please give me money so I can go and do something. We go door to door to knock on and to interrupt people's lives, to try to talk to them about stuff they mostly don't want to talk to us about. And we do it so that we can come here, work for five months out of the year, build these giant sandcastles of hopes and dreams, all to have them washed away at the end of session every single year. <laughs> then we go home and we think, you know what? I want to do that all over again. <laughs> And I'm one of them. I came back. And I have loved it, and I would probably come back a third time, although I hope the break is longer. <laughs> we have done good work here. Uh, this institution is what we make it. It is nothing else. It is a human place. Uh, Speaker Hortman, you have made it more humane. And when I first got here, I thought this place was nuts. I would sit here for endless hours of debate and listen to people say the same things over and over and over again, and I feel exactly the same way right now. <laughs> but at least we don't do it after midnight anymore, and that is because of Melissa Hortman. We've often said great things about the House staff, and we have often stood to applaud them, and we should do that. We have incredible people who work for us. We have not always paid them the way they should be paid. And we have made an effort in the last four years to take the political risk to increase the budget of the House of Representatives so that the people who work here actually make a decent wage. And we started with the people who've made the least because that is our basic job as employers, and that took all of us having the courage to say we're not afraid of the politics, we are going to do right by these people. <laughs> we've also done something, we've never done this before, uh, and this was pre-pandemic. We had enough trust across the aisle. The leadership on, uh, uh, with uh, Minority Leader Doubt, and what is your title? Deputy Minority Leader? We, have, we all make up these titles, just so everybody knows, both sides. Deputy Minority Leader, uh, New Brindley, 
uh, Speaker Hortman, the front desk staff. We shut everything down. We sent you all home, and we decided that we could close out a session and take a mes message from the Senate without having to hold people in reserve because we were afraid of what might happen. We decided that it's okay to tell you what our plans are and to warn you when we think, this one is uh, not germane, this one is out of order, we're going to take up these bills first. That never used to happen. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are some House staff who still think it maybe should not happen. <laughs> but in politics, I have a simple rule, which is if it costs you nothing, give it away. Give away everything that is free. It will eventually come back. And I think we've built a lot of trust across the aisle um, on how we run this place. So I want to first uh, recognize Susan Klossmore, the executive director of the Republican side, Gavin Hansen for always being here and being a good voice, a reasonable calm, uh, Brian Cook, who is gone, but we held this place together here. <laughs> Through some very hard times. I'm going to try to keep going into this. The first day we met post or in the pandemic, when you were all home, it felt like death in here. It felt like the world had ended. And we had to find the strength to continue on, and we did. And we could not have done that without the cooperation of the Republican members and staff. I want to say thank you for being our partners through that time. We also looked out for the health of our staff, and we fought political battles over what that meant. Uh, that was not our finest moment, in my opinion. We should not have ever made the health of our staff, our employees, and our fellow members a political question. And I'm not saying that is all anybody's fault, but that's how our politics is today. If one person takes a position, the other side has to say you're wrong, and I'm going to take the opposite view, and it feeds on itself. But we did, through our leadership, protect the health of the staff. We put that paramount, in, um, and it was worthwhile. One of the ways that we did that, and I'm really excited about this, we created House Rule 10, Emergency House Operations. And my favorite part about House Rule 10, 10.01, is paragraph D. It says, this rule sunsets the day following the last day of the 92nd regular session. That means. Once we adjourn today, there is no more remote legislating, and it should not happen. We don't work as well. We do not work as well sitting at home. We cannot represent Mankato. We cannot represent Bemidji. We cannot represent St. Louis Park. We cannot represent Minneapolis as well at home in our districts. We need to be here amongst people in order to do it well. We do have to find a way to accommodate people who want to testify from distant places. There are things, lessons to be learned, but we need to be present amongst ourselves in order to make this place function. The last thing I would say on that is we also need to make sure that this continues to be a place where families are welcome, where children are welcome, where people can have uh, family present. We have law just this weekend, or in the last week on the House, side, House DFL side, we have had a child born and a father lost. We can never forget the importance of centering the families that we all bring into this work in this place. That's why we should have food on the floor. That is why we should be able to have kids on the floor. That is why we should be able to bring the people who are closest us, to us into this work. And I just also uh, would like to say, that on the last final, uh, we also have to be ready. This is my blue folder. This is the uh, nuclear football, if you will, of the House of Representatives. I've had this ready since day one, moving the previous question. This is a, co a cooperative and a collaborative effort. I never wanted to move the previous question. 
but it is always the responsibility of the majority to pass legislation and do the business of the people of the state. You on the Republican side have cooperated with us enough to make this unnecessary, and that too is a change from the past. We should not do it, but we should always be ready. I also want to challenge us, though, because we are not everything that we could be. The House of Representatives is not everything that it could be. We face a state that is far more complex than it was when the annual legislature was created in 1970. Not only are we a much more diverse state, we are a larger state, our economy is more complex, our regulatory structure is greater, all of our state agencies are far larger and do far more. Our local governments operate all the time year round. They have more lobbyists coming to us than uh, almost anybody else. We have a judicial branch that is active full time all the time. And the Minnesota House of Representatives is the most direct link between the people of this state and their state government. We do not have enough time to do all of their business on the schedule that we have. We do not have enough time to provide the oversight that we need of our agencies and our local governments. We do not have enough time to dive deep into budgets and truly understand the impact, impact of what we do. And as much as it pains me to say it, Gene Pulowski is right. Introducing 5,000 bills is not a sign of good legislative work. It is a sign that we have become a bill factory and think that it's only our job to churn through more. We need a full-time legislature. We don't need to pass bills all year, but we at least need to recognize that the people who do the best work around here work all year long, and they don't do it for any compensation. We don't have the support structure to allow us to do oversight, to understand the impacts of budgets, and to truly do the work of the public. And I think there is no question that as we look to the next generation of legislation, the next generation of state government, we need to be ready to meet the needs of the people. And the Minnesota House of Representatives is their direct link and if we are not operating on a year-round basis, we are just giving up their power and giving it to people who are not directly accountable. That's us, and we should be doing it all the time. I also want to say that Minnesota government can be better. We have a tradition, a great tradition, born out of an earlier era, a nonpartisan tradition. On our side, the Farmer Labor Party and the DFL Party were agrarian. They believed that the average person could govern their own lives if they were given a fair opportunity to do so, and massive corporate power was a barrier to that. On the Republican side, you have believed that an administrative state that regulates every single thing that people do is also a barrier to what people can be and do. We need to look at our institutions anew all the time. We need to understand that what we have built in the past is not going to necessarily work for the future. We are an immensely more diverse state than we have been in the past. We are a state that looks like the rest of the nation. We need to be able to update our institutions and our traditions, our communities, our neighborhoods, and our families to welcome everybody in. If we cannot find the common ground, in the work we do in government to renew our institutions to meet those needs, Minnesota will not be a miracle state, it will be a mediocre state. I didn't sign up for that. So I think that we can do better. We need the work of this institution to reflect the expectations of our constituents, of the people who sent us here, that this matters, that their government is expected to work for them, it is supposed to work according to the very highest standards, and we are expected to do the work even when it is difficult even when it is personally challenging, even when it makes you want to cry, you still have to show up and do it and keep doing it. And I just want to close with something uh, personal to me, uh, and that is what it takes to be a leader. Uh, I've learned a lot from these people, a lot. <laughs> I've learned a lot from you too. But one of the things I, uh, I think is most important is to be self-reflective and to be a critical thinker about yourself and the situation that you're in. And when I was thinking about how to fill this job, I had to first understand what it is that Melissa would want me to do that could be of any value. And in recent days, I've been thinking, I'm not sure I've really done anything. But I have done a couple of good things. And uh, that is to hire people who fill all my, the gaps that I have. And I uh, want to say thank you to Paul. I, 
can't tell you how often he and I have made jokes at all of your expense <laughs> privately because it's how we deal with how insane this place can be sometimes. <laughs> Um, but he also pushes me to understand the humanity of, of everybody and what they bring, what their emotional needs are, and how we can figure out a way to come together. I want to say thank you to Nuchi Vang for being an incredible source of connection and glue. You make me do things I don't want to do every single day, and I never get upset about it. <laughs> Will Blavelt uh, is here, is not here, but he also makes me do things every single day, and I very often get upset about it, and that's why I hired him, because he makes me do the stuff I don't want to do at all. Often I sit in uh, meetings and I think, what is my purpose here? I have this incredible group of people, I have these amazing legislators who make these incredible speeches, do all this wonderful policy work, a leader who has uh, the good of the whole in her heart every single time there is an issue, and I think, I guess I just figured out how to be around the right people. So, Madam Speaker and members, I want us to close by thanking a few people. Uh, we've stood many, many times to recognize our front desk staff, and it is time for us to do it again today. Thank you. Keep standing. We have to thank Patrick McCormick and the House Research Department. We have remarkable nonpartisan staff. We need to recognize Emily Adrians and the House Fiscal Staff. I don't know how they do that work. Ryan Inman and the revisers team. I don't know exactly how that happens. It's remarkable, and you have kept us going time after time after time at the end of a session when you performed superhuman feats uh, to keep these bills going. Thank you to all of the revisers team.